Welcome to the founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International. This is a truly historic occasion. It is a milestone in the development of our international. We are proud to stand on the great traditions of the communist international. We trace our roots far back to the founding days of our movement when Marx and Engels wrote the great communist manifesto. Today we are retying the knot of history broken by Stalinism at a time when the world revolution is beginning to develop. And our task is to resolve the crisis facing humanity, the crisis of revolutionary leadership as the prerequisite for the victory of the world socialist revolution. We regard ourselves not as individual sections of this international. We regard ourselves as an integral part of the World Party of Socialist Revolution. There's never been a better time as now to found this international or refound this international. At a time when the lefts, the so-called socialists of the world, have adapted themselves to capitalism. There's never a better time to raise the genuine banner of communism internationally. And that is the reason why a whole series of our sections have renamed themselves revolutionary communists. Y por eso es que acciones alrededor de Nacional se han llamado el nombre, se han cambiado el nombre por el Partido Comunista Revolucionario. And at the end of this week, at the end of our deliberations, y al terminar esta semana, después de nuestras discusiones, we will take a vote vamos a votar to establish the Revolutionary Communist International. Para establecer la Internacional Revolucionaria. And we will broadcast this to the world. I would like to welcome, of course, all those comrades around the world in watch parties who are following our proceedings at this time. Online, I believe there are 120 countries of comrades and sympathizers following us at, the, at this stage. We send you our revolutionary greetings, comrades. And I would also particularly like to welcome our own gathering here today and the different sections that are present from, I think, most of the continents of the world. But I would like to particularly Welcome the comrades, our dedicated comrades from Pakistan, who are here. Pakistan. There are many comrades and, and, and sections who are represented, and I do want to individually mention them. The comrades from Bolivia. Bolivia. Welcome, comrades. <laughs> from Brazil. <laughs> from Colombia. De Colombia. From Chile. Chile. From Mexico. Mexico. From Peru, Peru, from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, from Canada, Canada. <laughs> from where else? <laughs> from Denmark, Dinamarca. Argentina. 
Austria. Austria. Belgium. Belgium. France. France. Germany. Germany. Greece. Greece. Hungary. Hungary. Ireland. Greece. Netherlands. Holland. Poland. Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, Sweden, Taiwan. Finland. The United States of America. Woo! Yugoslavia. Yeah. <laughs> now, I probably missed someone out here. Yeah? Yeah. What do you say? Oh, Britain. Oh, Christ. <laughs> All right, Johnny. Well, I've heard it. I've heard it. El Salvador. El Salvador. Venezuela. Venezuela. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Scotland, Wales. Come on. What's the matter with you? Great. There are sections, however, and individuals I cannot mention for security reasons. Hi. Sri Lanka? The Sri Lankan comments here? Yeah? Oh, Sri Lanka. sorry, this list is first time. Not the first time, but nevertheless, Sri Lanka! <laughs> well, it's a, a genuine gathering of the international representatives of revolution. But I've been asked to say, those watching, yeah. please, yeah. if you put uh, anything on the media, on social media, use the hashtag uh, RCI24. The hashtag RCI24. I would like to uh, inform you that uh, we have received uh, greetings from Comrade Ivan Pinero, who is the historical leader of the Brazilian Communist Party. This comrade has led, uh, well, was, was part of, uh, of the Brazilian Communist Party who were expelled for their ideas and have regrouped in, in uh, Brazil, are in very friendly relations with our comrades there and ourselves. And we would like to thank uh, Comrade Ivan for his greetings. They are long greetings, which I will not read out, but we will put online for every comrade to read here and internationally. Comrades, it gives me great pleasure in opening the first session of the manifesto to present a comrade that doesn't need any present presentation, Comrade Alan Woods. You know, there are, there are many times that it happens in history that people are living through an historical event an event of great historic significance. But at the time, they're not aware of it. They don't understand it. Now, I am not a person that is prone to exaggerate, if anything, the contrary. But I don't believe that I am exaggerating when I say that this meeting will be an historic meeting, which is destined to take some very, very important decisions, which will have eventually a decisive bearing on the actual results of the class struggle in the long run, in the long run. Now, the subject of my speech this morning is to present the manifesto, which I believe you've all read. But you know, I, I, think, I think that this is a text which speaks for itself. It does not require any further elaboration, but I'd just like to say, Rob mentioned it in his, in his opening remarks, that of course, we always think of that great 
founding Communist Manifesto, written by two young men, actually quite young men, they were very young, Marx and Engels, wrote this marvelous document in 1847, actually. But that was an historic event. That was an epoch-changing event. Although at the time, the actual numbers of people that supported those, they were organized in that organization, was extremely small, minuscule as a matter of fact. And no doubt, it, the, the writing of this document, which was probably, probably reached very few people at the time, did not have any, in the short run, didn't seem to have any fundamental effect. But here we see the most important thing, the most powerful thing in the world. It's not armies or navies or air, air forces. It is the power of ideas, great ideas. And no idea is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And you know, you know the most extraordinary thing about the, the, communist, the original Communist Manifesto? If you think, think of it, it, it is truly amazing, you know, that sometimes I hear people saying, not usually our own comrades, they're too sensible, but some people say, yeah, well, it's all very well, these old ideas, but don't we need new ideas? Well, I'll, I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something. I have studied the works of, of Marxism all my life. That's a long time now. I've also made it my business to study the so-called alternatives and the, the so-called criticisms of Marx. And I'll tell you this, I have never found any body of idea, none that could remotely compare in their profundity, in their scientific exactness, in their sheer brilliance than the ideas of Marx and Engels. And the most extraordinary thing about the, their manifesto, I'll tell you what it is. Of course, when people say to me, well, we, surely we need to change, change with the times and so, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. As a dialectical materialist, I must accept that. As a general principle, I can accept that, of course. Of course. To change, you see, if certain, certain things will have to be modified naturally. But comrades, the most extraordinary thing about the ideas of Marxism in general, and the Communist Manifesto in particular, is how little needs to be changed. And that's extraordinary. You think about it. You go on next Monday morning, go to any library, wherever you live, any university library, if you like, and get any, any bourgeois book written in 1847 about politics, economics, even history and so on, philosophy. And I will tell you right now, that book will merely be of historical interest. Actual relevance to the situation today, actual uh, applicability, zero or close to zero. But you read the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels. If you haven't read it, you should read it. If you have read it, read it again. I've read that book hundreds of times. And every time I read it, I learn something new. And what strikes you is this. This book, written in 1847, is not a description of the world of 1847 or 1848. It's not. Not at all. It's a book about today. It's the most modern book that you can read. It accurately ex expresses the nature of the capitalist system. And although it was written, let's, let's remember, it was written at the time when capitalism was still advancing, was still developing the productive forces. And in a sense, although, as Marx says in Capital, he says, capitalism was born with dripping blood from every pore in its system. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yes. Oh, yes. You look at the whole of human history. There have been, there have been many blood-soaked civilizations in the past. Many, many of them. People talk about the Aztecs and the human sacrifices and so things like that. But there's been no more terrible system, terrible crime against humanity, no worse destruction on a massive scale, no more genocide, no greater slaughter of the innocents, little children and so on, in the factories and in wars, countless wars, countless wars. Second, the Second World War, they, 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 they're celebrating the anniversary of D-Day now which is an insult to those brave men and women that died, died on the beaches in Normandy. It's an insult to their memory. These gangsters, this, uh, what's his name from, from America? Biden, that. <laughs> Genocide Joe has the audacity to come and talk about the, the sacrifice of these young lives. Okay. 
and all of, the, of these gangsters line up. Their hands are dyed red with blood. We will, de- we will deal with, with their criminal activities in the Ukraine, not just in Gaza, but in Ukraine also, and in Iraq, and in Afghanistan, and, in, and everywhere, and in Vietnam. You name it. These gangsters, these murderers, have the audacity to stand up and weep crocodile tears about the poor, poor guys who pen- perished on the beaches of Normandy. And by the way, reading these disgusting speeches, that's not a celebration of Normandy. That's the, the purpose is the opposite. It's not in favor of peace. It's beating the war drums to drum people up for militarization and more wars. And that, my friends, in the modern epoch is playing with fire. These, these warmongers, the struggle against militarization and war is one of the main features of our, of our new epoch and one of our main tasks of this international. But I've come somewhat off what I was going to say. That the capitalist system it was, it was the most bloodiest system. And yet in spite of that, you cannot and you must not, if you're serious, if you're serious about analyzing history, not from a sentimental, stupid point of view, but from, from a scientific point of view, you must understand that despite all these horrors and bloodshed and oppression, the capitalist system nevertheless played, played an historically progressive role in the only sense that, that that phrase could be understood, because it developed the means of production for a whole period. That's to say, agriculture, industry, science and technique and technology, all those things were developed, of course. Of course, at the cost of the blood, sweat and tears of, of the masses, that's true. But unconsciously, they were, they were not conscious of it. By their greed for profit and surplus value, they were developing the means of production. And therefore, unconsciously, it wasn't their intention, they were establishing the material basis for a higher society, which is called communism. And that's the whole point. That's why we are entitled to to, to call for the, the struggle for communism now, because that demand is not only possible in the past, it was not possible. The material basis material basis was absent. Now the material basis is present with the miracles of science and technology and medicine and everything else. This this is not utopian. It's it's, it's, It's a reality. We already have in our hands all the objective possibilities for creating communism. Yes, we have. We have. It is not just possible. It is an absolute necessity, an objective necessity that flows from objective conditions. And that's the first point that I wish to make. Why do we choose to launch a new communist international? Why are we taking this step? It's undoubtedly, it's a very ambitious step. No no doubt about it. And some communists will think, well, why? Why now, for example? Why now? Isn't this a bit of a sudden decision? that We've taken a sudden decision. It might seem to be sudden. It wasn't really sudden, actually. Wasn't, Wasn't it arbitrary? We could have, maybe, maybe we could have done this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, perhaps. Not at all, comrades. I hope to demonstrate to you in my short time at my disposal, whatever the rationale behind this important decision, whatever, whatever the reasons for it, there is absolutely not a gram of arbitrariness involved. It's not an arbitrary decision at all. It's a decision which flows naturally, inevitably from the existing conditions, as I hope to demonstrate. And of course, let's start by emphasizing the point. We make no apologies for basing ourselves solidly from the old, for the old ideas of Marx and Engels. You know, you don't, you don't actually have to reinvent the wheel, you know. It's not really necessary, I think. You, know. you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we certainly don't need to, need to reinvent the fundamental ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. That's what we base ourselves on. That's a fact. That's a fact. But see, now, now the capitalist system, it's not like 1847 at all, has decisively entered into a phase of, of senile decay. And there, there are reasons for this. There are reasons for this. Uh, let's be, always bear in mind that there are two fundamental obstacles which prevent the development of the productive, and therefore obstacles in the way of hum, human development, deve, the development of civilization, if you like. First, Private property of the means of production, number one, the so-called free market economy. That's the first obstacle which prevents the development of the productive. Secondly, that antiquated thing called the nation state, 
the national state or the national market, I don't care what you call it. It makes no difference, actually. No difference at all. Which, because the markets, even of the biggest country, like the USA, it's too narrow to contain the colossal productive potential that exists. So, you know, the question that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people ask me, how do, what is the reason for capitalist crisis? And I would answer, that's the wrong question. The question you ought to ask me is, why isn't the capitalist system always in crisis? Because it's not always in crisis. It's not always in crisis. By the way, there was some development of production even in the, in the 1930s, as a matter of fact. And you have the boom and slump cycle and so on. You have the boom and slump cycle. Are there some mechanisms whereby capitalism can avoid crisis or ameliorate crisis? I answer yes. Yes, there are. The mechanisms are well known. They're not secret. First of all, Keynes, Keynes explained a long time ago, you can avoid a slump, a crisis of overproduction, by the state. The state steps, the government steps in and spends a lot of money. Wonderful. You know, I think there are quite a few students present. Young, and you know, when I was a student, I learned one thing. The most pleasant thing in life is to spend other people's money. <laughs> yes, it's one of the credit, you get credit, you know, credit. Borrow, borrow money. Credit cards, credit cards, you know. It's wonderful until it's terrible. It's one tiny little, tiny little problem with Keynes' argument, tiny little problem. Sooner or later, this money must be paid back. Ah, ah. And now this is the problem. We'll we come to that in a moment. In, in the last 10 years or, or more, last 15 years, say, since the crisis of 2008, and by the way, I remind you, I remind you that before this time, all the bourgeois economists, these clever people in the universities with long letters after their names, writing books as well, what did they say about the state, about the government? The state must not intervene in the economy, must not intervene in the market. Remember that? Do you? I do. Okay. Uh, no, the, uh, the, ma the market must be left on its own. On its own, the free market will eventually decide. Yeah, fine. On paper, fine. What happened in 2008 when the banks were collapsing everywhere? Did, did they turn around and say, all right, the market will decide. Carry on, the market will decide. No, no. They came running to the government with their hands out. Save us, save us. And the government... The government obligingly did, did save them. They did save them. It was Bush at the time, George Bush. American comments will excuse my American accent. I'll get into, I'll get into terrible, terrible trouble now. How much you want, boys? How much you want? A billion? Take a billion. 10 billion? Take 10 billion. Yeah. Open, open checkbook. Take as much. And they did. They took and they took and they took. And they built up a huge mountain of debt. A huge mountain of debt. And the, 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 the private businesses, the corporations did that. Even, so, even many workers did that. Middle class people did credit, credit, credit. Okay, okay. But sooner or later, you know, the, the, the moment of truth arrives. This was a very dangerous thing for them to do. And they did the same thing on a bigger scale during the COVID pandemic. Vast amounts of government money was spent. Vast amounts was injected into the economy. Yes. Did it succeed? Yes, it succeeded. It succeeded. Did they avoid a crisis? Yes, they avoided the crisis. And everyone was happy. It's a bit like a drug addict, you know. Not, not, I'm not speaking from personal experience. I, I had a very innocent life when I was a young student, <laughs> at least as far as drugs were concerned. <laughs> anyway, uh, a drug addict, you inject, some, you inject some heroin. You feel great. And you need a bigger shot. You need a bigger shot. You feel great again. No problem. You keep on injecting yourself. And, the, and then the crisis comes, and in order to save your life, the, the drugs are stopped. And then you end up in a terrible state. That comes, that's the position now. Now, let's put it in a, in, in a very simple way. For the whole of the last period, the capitalist system went beyond its limits, far beyond its limits. And now, of course, they have to pull back. So, everything goes into reverse, and you begin to enter into a downward spiral. All those factors that pushed the economy up are now being pushed, is pushing the economy down. Huge debts on the one hand. I got the figures here somewhere. I'll, I'll deal with the figures in a moment. And vast inflation, which they cannot control, because they're still, although it's gone down somewhat, but it's still present, which means the banks can't reduce the interest rates. 
And therefore, that makes a recession ultimately inevitable. And these debts, by the way, they absolutely, they, 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 make, they, make, they make your eyes water. Now, I'm speaking from memory, and uh, comments know my memory is not, not always very good. But I believe that the, 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 the total debt of the United States is, I think, it was the latest figure that I heard was 134 trillion. 134 trillion. That's 134 million million dollars, which I think is about 100 and approximately 130 percent of the American GDP, which is, which is not much different to Italy, I think. Italian commons will correct me. Now, nobody talks about this. It's like some very unpleasant personal diseases, particular, particularly affect the male species, which you don't like to talk about in polite society. You don't talk about it, you know. Well, the, Ameri the American debt is like that. Let's talk about it here. Let's talk about it here. Let me tell you, what does this mean? It means that the United States, the most powerful and wealthiest capitalist country in the world, is bankrupt. It's bankrupt. Any other country, they'd be sounding the alarm. But it's not, not any other country. It's the United States. And they continue to spend money like water, you know. Arms for the Ukraine. Arms for Israel. Now they want to pick a fight with China. We, we, we'll come to that in a moment. Actually, actually, American imperialism has overreached itself. They've, they've also gone past their limits. That's, that's what happened to the Roman Empire, by the way. Part of the reason it was overthrown. It, it, it extended itself too much. They, they went too far. And there is, and the question is this. You don't talk about it, it will, perhaps it will go away. Perhaps it will go away. It will not go away. I read somewhere, I don't know if it's right, I'll have to check it. I read somewhere that the, the, the U.S. debt is increasing at the astonishing rate of $1 trillion every three months. And you can't escape from this. There is such a thing, by the way, as the, the free market, you know, market forces which these, uh, these bourgeois have, have forgotten about. And sooner or later, the markets will inflict what is called a correction on the United States. And it will be a, ve a, it'll be a very painful correction. Now, in America, take America as a case in point. Biden is trying to say that there's an economic recovery. There's a recovery, there's a recovery. That's, that's his main slogan, to win the elections. I don't see how he can win the election, by the way. But he's, he's, play he's, he's in fact emphasizing the economy. Everything is fine. The problem is that nobody believes him. Now, this is an important point. Theoretically, the American economy is still advancing, theoretically. But millions of American people, American workers and middle class people, they don't feel better off. They don't feel prosperous. They feel poorer. The reason they feel poorer is because they are poorer. The prices continue to rise. And therefore, it's a, it's a struggle to, to, to survive. Therefore, you see in America, by the way, I'll come back to this question, the beginnings of, of, of quite a significant uh, spate of strikes. And you have, of course, the student revolt. I'll come back to these questions later. But this is a general situation. It applies to all countries. It's huge debts, huge debts. And sooner or later, as the Swiss comrades know, mountains have avalanches. And that's, that's, that's on the cards. That's what's what it is. That's what it, that, that awaits the, the capitalist system. It awaits capitalism. Yeah, but look, even if they avoid a, a, a sort of recession, let's say, they, let's say they avoid a slump. I don't see how they can ultimately, but there you are. It doesn't, doesn't matter. That would not solve their problems because there's a, in all countries now, beneath the surface of apparent stability, there is a growing feeling of anger, of discontent, of fury, above all of frustration beneath the surface. You can't see it, but it's there. And people feel that uh, they're poor. They're not getting any better. This is bad. Now look, you know, we can make a mistake here. And I have seen this mistake made by some of our sections in the past. I will not mention any, but I've seen it. Comrades, the most important question for us in all of this is the question of consciousness. Consciousness of all classes, by the way, but above all, the consciousness of the working class and the youth. And the mistake commerce sometimes make is this. Let me, let me explain. You cannot understand the change of consciousness purely from the number of strikes or election results 
or polls or street demonstrations. These are all important facts which we must consider. But there is a deeper process of consciousness, of changing consciousness than that. Underneath the surface, but you can't see it. You can't quite put, you can't quite put your finger on it, but you know it's there all the time. Now, you know, there is an analogy. I think it's a very precise analogy between geology and politics, also economics. You know, the, 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 the Earth's surface seems to be solid, seems to be static. You know, you, we have an expression in English. I don't know if we have it in other languages. Let me see. As solid as the ground under my feet. You heard that expression? Yeah, the ground seems to be solid, doesn't it? It's not moving. It's still there. Same as yesterday and the day before yesterday. The problem is this, my dear friends. The ground on your feet is not solid, not at all. And beneath the very, very thin surface of rock and earth, which we call the ground, you know how thin this is? You might be surprised if I tell you. It's as thin as a skin on an apple. That's all. That's all that separates us in this room from the most terrifying phenomena you can imagine. Enormous quantities of molten rock, extreme temperatures, and extreme pressure, which is building up all the time, ceaselessly, without stop, all the time. And it's seek seeking a weak point in the Earth's surface. And sooner or later, takes a long time, takes a long time, geological time. But sooner or later, it will find a weak spot and will burst forth unexpectedly. You can't predict this. You see, geology is a science. I, I'll deal in my next lecture, I will deal with the question, is Marxism a science? It is a science. It is a science. Marxism is a science. It's not an exact science. Uh, as geology is not an exact science. You can't predict when an earthquake is going to happen or a volcanic eruption. But you can predict with certainty, with certainty, that earthquakes will take place in such and such a place. An earthquake will take, take place in such and such a place. For example, the city of San Francisco, it's, it's a doomed city. It's a doomed city. Sooner or later, that city will be destroyed in a terrible eruption. The movement of the tectonic plates, which lead to the creation of new continent, continents. And this movement is always accompanied by the most terrific explosions known to man. I've just, the, the same thing applies with society. Beneath the surface of apparent calm, in all countries, without exception, there's a steady growth. There's an enormous accumulation of rage, of anger, and of frustration. Of anger against the status quo. And it's only our tendency that has picked up on this. The others are blind. Now, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Now, you see, we are now in a situation of the most serious crisis in the history of capitalism. It's an existential crisis. Doesn't mean to say that the capitalist system will collapse tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I'm not saying that. Let us be very clear about this. The capitalist system will never collapse of its own accord. Never. The ruling class is determined to keep, keep, it, keep itself alive. Although it's a decrepit, dying system, but they, they, they're determined to stay alive. Even if that means dragging the whole of humanity down into the abyss with it. Eh, don't mind. Don't care about that. There's that. And there are other problems which we'll, de we'll deal with. There are other obstacles which the working class must overcome. But in the final analysis, whether capitalism is overthrown or not, it depends upon the conscious movement of the working class. A revolution. And that, in turn, depends upon the leadership, upon the subjective factor. We'll come to that in, in, later on. But if one looks at the present uh, quality of leadership of the bourgeoisie internationally, it is, it is quite astonishing. You know, I mean, take Britain, for example. You might say, no, you take Britain. <laughs> there we are. It's just, just a matter of opinion, that's all. I take Britain. Now, in the course of my long and eventful life, I've lived under many, many governments in Britain, some of them bad, some of them worse, some of them stupid, some of them a bit cleverer. But I've never in my life until now lived under a government of certifiable lunatics. Yeah, but, but they're not alone, are they? They're not alone. I mean, just look at Biden. Jesus, H. Christ. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the mind boggles. I mean, that, that he is a, a, a senile, senile 
senile old, decrepit old imbecile is clear. That's, uh, there's no doubt about that. But I, I, I begin to believe he's a little bit uh, not quite compost mentis. He's a bit deranged. I'm, I'm, ser I'm speaking seriously. He pushes the Ukraine. I'll deal with the Ukraine in a moment. He pushes the Ukraine into an unnecessary and criminal war with Russia, which is obstinately continuing, despite the fact that the, the war is lost. Every, everyone knows that the war is lost. I'll deal, but he's still continuing. He's made a complete mess of things in, in Gaza and the Middle East. And he's still continuing the same policy. I think his understanding of foreign policy is approximately this. If a policy fails and is seen to be failing repeatedly and catastrophically, what do you do? Obvious. You continue doing the same policy. That's what he's doing. And not, not satisfied with that, I think that would be quite enough. He's trying to pick a war with China. I mean, this is, it's just, it, words fail me. And all of these leaders are just, I mean, look, look at Macron in France. I think he's a bit deranged as well. He's a bit of a lunatic as well. He wants to be a great world leader. I think Mickey Mouse would be a better, better <laughs> candidate. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, but let, let's leave that. Look, all of them are bankrupt. All of them. Well, the ones in the, 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 <laughs> on the enemy side, they're a bit smarter, I must say that. Look, you say what you like about Vladimir Putin. He's a very bad man. He's a gangster. Say what you like. But one thing he is not, he is not stupid. Same thing can be said of Xi Jinping in China. Not stupid. Anyway, we'll come to that in a moment. But you see, now, the question is this. You might think, oh, no, Alan, you're attaching too much importance to the individual. Surely we believe in something else, the productive forces, something like that. As if, indiv as if individuals play no role in history. You think that's Marxism? I don't know what it is. Marxism, it certainly is not. History is made by men and women, for God's sake. Can't be made by anybody else. Can't be made by anybody else. And the quality of uh, these people, the quality of leadership, is not a secondary matter. Nevertheless, what I, what I agree with is this. Can we explain the present crises by the stupidity of the leaders? No, you cannot. Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. You cannot explain the crisis by the stupidity of the leaders, but you can explain the stupidity of the leaders by the crisis. That's a fact. Let me, let me put, put, it, put it this way. Even if instead of these idiots, they are idiots, all of them, even if you had uh, clever people, capable, intelligent politicians, would it make a difference? Well, yes, it would make some dis difference, no doubt. <laughs> would it make a fundamental difference? No, it would not. Because this crisis cannot be solved. That's the point. They can't solve it. They're thrashing around blindly looking for, for solutions, which are no solutions. Yes, but with good leaders, you might uh, have some effect. In some, establish, establish some kind of a temporary equilibrium, perhaps. With bad leaders... You turn a bad situation into an absolute catastrophe. And that's what you can see with your eyes. That's what you can see now. Absolute catastrophe. One catastrophe after another. And that, is, that leadership is very much to do with that. And then if we look at the other possible leaders, take the reformists. You might say, no, you take the reformists. <laughs> now, let's be clear. In the past... Reformism had a solid base in the, in the, in the mass of the world. It had a solid base. It made sense. Because in the past, when capitalism was in a phase of upswing, as it was for decades following the Second World War, which was the biggest upswing of the productive forces in the whole of history, including the Industrial Revolution, ca the capitalist uh, leaders were able to give some concessions, in the advanced countries anyway. They were able to give. They gave concessions. Why not? Why not? To blunt the classroom. To blunt the classroom. And they did, blunt, they did blunt it. In America, for example, in Britain, they blunted it for a whole period. And a certain softness began to creep in, into the working class even. That was the classic period of reformism. That's the reason why reformism triumphed in that period. Not because they had clever leaders, they didn't. But the capitalist system was able to give concessions, able to give reforms, important reforms. Now, Reformism with reforms makes sense. Workers, workers are uh, realist, realists. Makes sense. And therefore, therefore, 
Our arguments as revolutionaries could not succeed. At that time, couldn't succeed. Couldn't succeed. You, we, we were faced with the solid, the solid blocks of the social democracy and the Stalinists who became like, like reformists. Is, that was an objective thing. Objective. But you see, now what's the position now? The capitalist system is in, no longer in a position now, now, no longer in a position to grant reforms, new reforms. They can't even guarantee the maintenance of those conquests of the past. They can't do it. Therefore, the crisis of capitalism is also the crisis of reformism. Because reformism without reforms, reformism with counter-reforms, makes no sense to anybody. And therefore, you have a crisis of reformism. And what you see at, at the moment, this, the, a number of elections are taking place right now, as I speak. And you see... Uh, this is the European elections, and the bourgeois is terrified. They're shouting about the resurgence of what they call, what do they call it? Uh, the, the extreme right-wing parties and so on. I don't know whether that phrase is actually com absolutely correct. They are, they are reactionary parties, there's no, no argument about that. Although they have different programs. Like, for example, in Britain they stand for, what is it, Farage. He's, he aims to be the leader of the Tory party, not Farage. He stands for free, and free market economics and so on. Whereas I think in Italy, for example, the, the Mer what's her name? Meloni, I think she stands more for state intervention. That's the traditional fascist idea as well. But uh, they have different... Uh, but, but anyway, the threat that they pose is, in, is further instability. And above all, what the bourgeois was worried about is the collapse of the center. And that is a, an international phenomenon. The collapse of the political center, which for a long time acted as the glue holding everything together. And this glue is coming apart. And the, the, the danger is, the total is 120. The danger is that that leads to polarization, class polarization. That's the danger that they see. And the right wing can actually provoke a reaction to the left, which it will, by the way. It will, it will. Everywhere, I'll come back to the elections later. And the question of consciousness, which is the key question. But to go back to the question of, uh, of inter international relations, world relations, what we see at the present time, let's express a, a general uh, point, the, the equilibrium, before there was like an unstable, a temporary equilibrium, which had a certain basis, partly economic. By the way, I mentioned there were two reasons for the crisis of capitalism. One was private ownership. The other was the nation state, the national market. It's the same, same thing. And they, 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 they got around that temporarily by the phenomenon known as globalization. Marx, Marx predicted that in advance. But an enormous, unprecedented expansion of world trade, <coughs> particularly since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which opened up new markets. And that had a colossal effect, actually. It acted as a driving force for the world economy for a whole period. But that reached its limits probably at the end of the 1990s, I guess, approximately. And ever since that time, it's gone into reverse. Now there's a reaction against globalization and the rise of economic nationalism, summed up in the slogan of, 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 America, of, of, of Trump, America first, he says. Yes, if it's America first, it's the rest of the world last, obviously. And America uses its domination now to, to, to grab markets and to grab and to assert its domination. It make, it's quite amusing. They've invented a phrase. I don't know if you know, know this phrase. The international rules-based uh, system. Order, I beg you, order, that's right. Thank you, Pip. What's it mean? Anyone know? Anyone explain to me what it means? I don't know. I couldn't tell you what it means. Or rather, I could tell you what it means. It's not, it's not difficult. They accuse constantly, they accuse Russia and China and Iran of uh, destroying this wonderful international rules-based order. Okay. Question number one. What are the rules? Nobody knows. Nobody can say. And the reason for that is very simple. The rules are made up by the United States of America at their convenience. And these rules can change whenever it suits the Yanks to change them. Now, the Blinken just went to China. And he lectured Xi Jinping. Just imagine, Xi Jinping is a serious political leader. Anthony Blinken is a circus clown. 
They send a circus clown to discuss with Xi Jinping. And the circus clown lectured Xi Jinping as if he was a little child. China must stop its trade with Russia because Russia is using this to boost its economy and to carry on the war with Ukraine. All false, entirely false, by the way. Now, the Chinese, I note, are very polite people. And they don't normally lose their temper or raise their voice or start shouting. The Americans spend most of their time banging the table and shouting at the rest of the world. I think the American Marines used to have a slogan, didn't they, John? What was it? Um, Speak softly and carry a big stick. Hmm? Quite, quite an intelligent slogan, that. Quite, quite, it's quite clever. But now, I, I, don't know what, I don't know whether they've got a big stick or not. I think the stick is shrinking all the time. But they spend the time shouting and bawling and insulting people, you know? Like, uh, like Joe Biden. He's, he's obs the man is obsessed with Putin. It's a personal thing. It's, it's like he, he seemed, I think he's seen too many of these cowboy films. And John Wayne, he thinks he's John Wayne in a cowboy film. Shouting and bawling. You know. the, the problem is Putin. The problem is Putin. <laughs> Some total of his knowledge. So they, they, they tried it with Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping re responded politely, in polite language. My knowledge of Chinese is not that great, but I think, I, as far as I understand it, in my translation into, into Welsh, is what he, the message he sent back to, to Washington with, by, with uh, Blinken was, go and fuck yourself. <laughs> you t you're telling China who they can trade with? God. What are you talking? You're talking to us as we were a little... A little poor nation, we're not. You carry on. So now there's an in increasing tension between America and China. That's okay. We'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. But this insane policy, what it is, America is trying to assert its power, its global power, at a time when its power is actually limited. limited. Let's be clear. I said it before. I'll repeat it. The Americans deliberately pushed the Ukraine into a senseless war with Russia, which was quite unnecessary, quite unnecessary. Yeah, they could have agreed that, that the Ukraine needn't, needn't join NATO. Now, this, now Biden's saying, well, perhaps they, sh perhaps they shouldn't join, join NATO anytime soon. It's too late. Too late for that. And they thought, the, what were their war aims? They were going to use Ukraine, not, not their own soldiers. The Ukrainians were going to sh shed, shed their blood. Use Ukraine as a proxy. They, they, they would receive sophisticated... Sophisticated modern weapons from the U.S. and NATO. They would easily defeat the Russians, who they thought wrongly, very wrongly, were backward with a very poor army and poor weapons and not able to compete. All wrong, quite wrong, quite wrong. Russia has a very powerful army indeed. And instead of the Ukrainians beating the Russians, the Russians have beat the Ukrainians. The, 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 the Americans sabotaged every attempt to reach an agreement. They were attempts to reach an agreement. Sabotaged. Deliberately. They sabotaged the Kiev, uh, the, uh, what was it, the, the, the Minsk agreement. They admit that they sabotaged it. Deliberately. They sabotaged the Istanbul agreement after it had been signed by both the Ukrainians and the Russians. They then pushed the Ukrainians into a senseless offensive last year. Was it last year or the year before? Last year, last, last year yes. Give them all these wonderful, wonderful weapons. You remember that each, each time there's a, a new wonder weapon, which is going to be a game changer. You know the expression? It's going to change everything. Like the leopard tank from Germany. What happened to the leopard tank? They don't talk about it anymore. It's too embarrassing for the Germans, for the German army. The British, the British, of course, the, British, the biggest warmongers of all, they sent them the, the chieftain tank. Marvelous tank. Modern, sophisticated, big guns. Heavy. Trouble is that the Ukrainian landscape is quite muddy, you know. Lots of mud. And these great heavy tanks were sinking in the mud. It, there were photographs in the British press. Challenger tanks stuck in the mud. The same thing with the Abrams tank. Just blown up. Nothing. Nothing. Patriot missiles blown up. Now they've run out of Patriot missiles. And now they say, oh yes, ah, this offensive failed. Now they admit at last, it failed. Let me tell you something about my knowledge of war. In a war, armies do not fail. They either win or they're defeated. That's what happens. And the Ukrainian army was catastrophically and humiliated, defeated by the Russians. Something they're not, they're not prepared to admit. And now the Russians are advancing. 
They staged another offensive now in Kharkiv. I don't think they want to take Kharkiv, the city, just now. They'll choose their time. And what the Russians are doing is quite clear what they're doing. They are systematic. They're not engaging in a big offensive. They are systematically using. They have com complete control of the air, absolute control of the air. They can bomb and strafe as much as they like. Nothing that the Ukrainians can do about it. Nothing they can do about it. And they are killing very large numbers of Ukrainian soldiers. Very large numbers. By the way, it is not true that the Russians are, is, are having colossal losses. They did have some losses at the beginning, and they made some mistakes. But they learned. The Russian losses now, the Russian losses now are relatively small, and most of the losses on the Ukrainians are inflicted by bombs, missiles, and artillery strikes. The, the figures of Ukrainian losses are horrific, horrific. And Zelensky is continuing his madness of driving large numbers of Ukrainians to their death. He can't stop the Russians. He will not stop the Russians. And uh, I think the, I don't know how long this will go on for. Look, all, every, oh yeah, the, the latest wonderful weapon is the F-16 fighter. That's another wonder weapon, which they've been building up again. Once again, they're building this up. The Russians have actually got more advanced fighters than that, but that's a separate question. Fighter bombers, that's a separate. But the thing is, the Ukrainians can't use this aircraft. They can't use it. It's so sophisticated, it requires special uh, uh, strips, air, air, aerodromes, which they don't possess. And if they, if, they, if, they, if they attempt to use Polish or Romanian bases, Putin has warned them, you do that and we will target them. Don't never mind about anything, we we'll target them. No. They, so the Russians, were, they, they're steadily advancing. It seems, it seems to be, it might seem to you to, to be not, not a very dramatic advance. It's one step at a time. I wrote an article, I think in January, that the, the fall of Artivka, which is a small village, but it was an important place represented a change in the situation. And it was, I said it was the beginning of the end. I think that's correct. As I speak, there's a battle taking place in a place called, a small place called Chasif Yar. It's a very savage and a, 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 a bloody battle, but it's gonna fall any, any day now it will fall. And I think that that, that again will, will, will mark, you see, this is, this is precisely a dialectical process to go back to what I said about avalanches. An avalanche, doesn't begin as an avalanche. It begins with just a few pebbles being loose. That's it. Nothing. Yeah. And th those few pebbles continue to tumble, continue to cascade, gathering strength until eventually, suddenly, suddenly, there's a catastrophic collapse, a catastrophic avalanche. Clausewitz explains that's just what happens in war. I'll make a prediction now. First of all, have, have, has the Ukrainian defenses collapsed so far? No, they've still got possibilities. But there's a problem. They've, they're running out of, of manpower. They've run out of manpower. They can't replace the losses. The Russians can't. And therefore, there's a problem. Now they're, they're, they're rounding up people by force, young men being forced into the army against their will. It's not, this, in the early days of the war, there were que long queues of people joining the army. That's finished. That's finished. Now there's a mood of pessimism, of demoralization, of defeatism. It's present in the army, which, where there's a rebellious mood, by the way. There's a rebellious mood. And in the, in the, in the Kiev government, there's panic. The report, reports are that uh, Zelensky himself is in a state of panic, shouting and screaming at his generals that you're lying to me, you're not telling the truth. They are telling the truth. In other words, all the ingredients are there for a complete collapse. By the way, the, the latest money from the states won't make any difference. Won't make any difference. I can expand upon that if you wish. It won't make any difference. So therefore, th this, I'll, I'll make just one prediction. There will be a collapse, perhaps, perhaps even without the Russian offensive, there'll be a collapse in Ukraine. And that could happen at any time. It, it will happen suddenly, without warning. And that will be a, a humiliating defeat for the West and for, for NATO. Let's look at the other. By the way, one of the symptoms of this crisis it's first of all, it's instability, general instability, economic instability, diplomatic instability, social instability, military instability. And you see that with, with the emergence of wars. There's the war in the Ukraine. I spent some time on it because that's a key question now. There's, the one, there's also the war in Gaza, if you can call it a war. It's not a war, it's a massacre carried out by Israel with the complicity of the United States, with Biden's stupidity. Supporting Netanyahu. Well, he had to support Netanyahu because all U.S. administrations are obliged to support Israel. So that was, that was predictable. 
But did he really have to jump on this, this old man? Did he have to jump on a plane, a private plane, and rush to Jerusalem to embrace Netanyahu in public and give him, a, a, in effect, a, a, a blank sheet to do what he wants? He didn't. He didn't have to do that. With the result, now the U.S. is completely discredited, and Netanyahu does just what he wants. What he wants is to continue the war indefinitely. You see, there's a problem here. There's two elections take. There's two elections, if you like. There's one election in America in November, which I'm sure Biden is going to lose, and I think it's entirely likely that Trump will win. Whether or not he's found guilty of being a criminal or whatever it makes no difference. Isn't isn't it amazing? It is amazing. And it's a sign of political, extreme political instability in America. Until recently, you had two solid columns, the Republicans and the Democrats. That was the guarantee of political stability. Not anymore, particularly with the emergence of Donald Trump. And they are determined to try to stop him from getting elected. The establishment, the ruling class. But they're not able to stop him. And you see, in a, in a peculiar way, he's a Trump is a reactionary, it goes without saying. But he's not completely stupid. And he's played, demagogically plays on this question, against the establishment, drain the swamp, all this demagogic nonsense. And that connect, connects with millions of people. So it's, I think it's wrong to see the Trump, the Trump movement, if you like. It is reactionary. It's, it's wrong to assume that all of these people are reactionary fascists. That's not the case. In a peculiar way, that also expresses the deep discontent or I would say hatred of the existing setup, hatred of the existing establishment. And, and actually he's going to win. According, in the US, by the way, you can win even if you're a convicted criminal. I mean, after all, if you look at all the US presidents in the past, most of them, weren't they all criminals? Most of them were, I think, you know. Didn't do them any harm, you know. So he's on. So Biden is afraid he's going to lose the election. And this, this war in, in Gaza now has, re, has really hurt, hurt his chances. I'll deal with the student movement in the States in a moment because that's a, a key question for us. But uh, therefore, he's losing support in those, in those areas of Muslim, high percentage of, of Muslim people and young people. He's lost the vote. Many of them say, we're not going to vote Democrat. We're not going to vote for Biden. Some of them even say, we'll vote for Trump. Anything except Biden. So he's desperate that the war should stop. He's trying to work out all, all kinds of so-called compromises, which will not work. They haven't worked. They won't work. And the reason they won't work is because Net Netanyahu will not accept them. I don't think he's a prisoner to his right wing and nonsense like that. That's not the case. He's not. He's pursuing his own interests. He's pursuing his own interests. Because the moment that that war finishes, he's finished. He's deeply unpopular. So his political future is finished. And also a, sl a little problem, he'd probably end up in jail for corruption. So as far as he's concerned, he doesn't care how many people get killed. He continues. He continues. This slaughter, this terrible, it is, if it's not genocide, it's something close to it. Uh, you see, yeah, yeah. But, and by the way, what this shows is the limits of American power. The Americans are desperately trying to put pressure to stop this war because it doesn't suit them. And they can't control their own puppet. So therefore, this terrible, this appalling slaughter will continue for the time being. Netanyahu says, until Hamas is completely destroyed. Hamas will not be completely destroyed. It's beyond his capabilities to do that. So these horrors will continue. Yeah, now we all know about the horrors of war. We don't need, le we don't need lectures of pacifists to know that war is a terrible thing, that it means terrible suffering for millions of people. We know this, but that's not all that war does. All history shows us that war can produce revolution. War can produce revolution. It, it usually does, one way or the other, sooner or later. That's what happened in 1917, isn't it? Oh, yes. Or 1918 in Germany and Austria and so on. Yeah, it's implicit. Now, look at the position in the Middle East. Those, Arab, those reactionary Arab regimes, like Jordan and so on, that, that always supported the United States, the Jordans were very stupid to support the, uh, the Israelis against the Iranian, uh, the Iranian missiles. That was a bad mistake. But the masses in these countries are enraged. They're furious, naturally. They see, they see the daily slaughter of men, women, and children on the television screens. And that affects them very deeply. It affects them very deeply. 
And therefore they're on the move. They're on the streets. They're demonstrating as well. They're very angry demonstrations. And if this slaughter continues, it is entirely possible that uh, one or more of these regimes is going to be overthrown. That's one element which must be worrying the strategies of capital. But more worrying still is the effect that this war has had in the United States as, as, as shown by this marvelous movement of the students, which is very, it is very similar. I, I remember the Vietnam War very, very well. It's very similar to the effects of the Vietnam War. Huge movement. And uh, this is taking off all over the United States. And all, all the acts of repression, all that the repression is doing, it's been quite, quite brutal repression, because America is a democracy after all. Like Israel, this was also repressing demonstrations in Israel. Another democracy. This is a, but the repression only serves to make people more angry, more radical, more politicized. And therefore, this is an important ingredient, a very important. And you see how it spreads, like Vietnam, it spreads to Canada, to France, to Paris, to, uh, uh, to Britain, even Australia. And it continues to grow. And this presents our international with its first opportunity, which I'm pleased to say we've grasped with both hands. And the point about it is this. What does this movement represent? Now, you, could, you might say if you were a stupid sectarian, which I hope you were not, ah, it's just the students. It's only middle class students. The working class is the thing. The working class is OK. OK. But you see, in all of history, look at history. It is almost, it's practically a law that revolutionary movements always start with that layer, with the students and so on, the intellectual youth and so on. It was the case in Russia, and it's the case in the United States. It was the case in France, 1968, don't forget. Now, I don't wish to exaggerate the role of students. That's not, we're not, we're not studentists. We stand firmly on a proletarian basis, but nevertheless, Students can play a very important role as a catalyst, if you like. And what does this movement represent? Well, of, of course, it represents the natural feelings of revulsion and, and hatred of, of, of the horrors, the atrocities being perpetrated by Israel in Gaza. That's true. But it's not just that. These gangsters, these people, so-called leaders, self-elected self leaders, by the way, of, of the Palestine movement, I don't know who elected them. Nobody knows. They just appear and they say, well, we're the leaders. And they want to control everything. And they want to stop the movement from becoming radicalized. By the way, they use identity politics as a tactic for, uh, for, for combating revolutionaries. They say, only Palestinians can speak. Well, there aren't any Palestinians around at the moment. It doesn't matter. This kind of thing. This kind of nonsense. There must be no politics, no communism. Can't sell your paper. Can't use your slogans. Nonsense. Nonsense. Where our comrades have intervened and boldly, and they've ignored this trash. The young people, the great majority of young people, are, including, including the, the Palestinians and the Muslim youth and so on, are very enthusiastic and very open. They have no problem at all. And they're interested in, in, not just in the Palestine, but they're interested in revolution and they're interested in communism. We've proven this in practice. Okay, so that's, so that's a huge opportunity for us. In Britain, I think this will be discussed later on this, this, uh, in the next few days. I won't dwell upon it. We've had a huge breakthrough with the intervention of, of, of Comrade Fiona Lally, which I think you know about, who in a public debate on television <laughs> smashed the, the best known leader of the right wing of the Tory party, Suella Braverman, former home minister, was smashed. And this went viral with, with millions, I think five million hits, I'm not sure. It's, it's more than that now. It's more than 10 million with he, a huge response, including in the Middle East with, with Arab, uh, it's been published with Arab, Arab subtitles and so on. And as, as you probably know, at this moment that I'm speaking now, that's why Fiona is not here. We decided, which is an exception, it must be, mustn't be taken as a rule. It was for particular circumstances. We decided to put her, or just her, forward in one part of London, working class part of London, where there's a big Muslim population, to put her forward as a candidate, a candidate of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Although for technical reasons, we couldn't put the, the party immediately on. We put it, she's got to stand as an independent, formally. But everyone knows that she's, a, she's, standing, she's standing for our party in Britain. Now, that's just an example 
of the enormous possibilities that exist and an enormous change in consciousness, which only our tendency, only our international was able to detect. Nobody else. When everyone else, all these so-called Trotskyists, so-called, these sectarians on the fringes of the movement and the left reformists, all of them were, were going around weeping into their herbal tea, mourning, you know, how terrible things are. Everything is black, everything is reaction, nothing is to be done. It reminds me of a poem by Edward Lear with a very amusing cartoon. What is it called? You can't translate, difficult to translate this. There was an old man of Cape Horn, Cape Horn, Cabo the Quernum. There was an old man of Cape Horn who wished that he'd never been born. So he sat on a chair till he died of despair. <laughs> that miserable old man of Cape Horn, and that's what, just a, just a poem, that's all. But I mean, these people are consumed with the poison of pessimism, consumed with the poison of, of skepticism, consumed actually with the poison of cynicism, lack of faith in communism, lack of faith in the working class, lack of faith in the revolutionary youth, and lack of faith in themselves. That's understandable, of course. That's perfectly understandable. No, no, no comments. Look, we were the only ones to see this, for God's sake. And the, the message is, I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier about consciousness. You do not and cannot measure changes of consciousness of the masses purely in terms of strikes and demonstrations or even elections. Beneath the surface, there is this sub powerful subterranean current. This movement of the youth, for example, the students naturally cannot play an independent role in the class struggle. That's ABC stuff. Little child knows that. We don't have to be told that. Yes, but after A, B, C, there are other letters in the alphabet. You have to learn these, these other letters. The students can't play an independent role. That's true. But they can play a role, and it can be an important role under certain circumstances. Because, I'll tell you why, because they are a very sensitive barometer of the moods that exist in society, the tensions in society. They express this. And because, because of this sensitivity, they can express this mood in an open way before anybody else. But this mood, it is not just a question of the Palestines, Palestine question. It's not just a question of Gaza, it isn't. It's part of a general malaise and frustration and hatred against the status quo in general. You know, one of the most incredible things about this uh, election campaign, which we, we are holding now, is we are getting an astonishing response from young Muslim women, a huge response. And that's not an accident. These are people that are oppressed, doubly and triply oppressed. They see, but they see in Fiona, I say, a role model. Some of our comments are a bit uh, narrow in their approach to politics, I think. They say, oh yeah, well, you can't have too much personality and there's too much, uh, too much Fiona, too much pictures. <laughs> no, no, and furthermore, no. Look. I'll tell an ABC consideration. The mass of people always personify a party or a movement. Always. They don't understand abstraction, abs ab abstract editorials, abstract articles, anonymous articles, anonymous central committees, and so on. They don't understand that. They understand people. The Bolshevik Party was known as the party of Lenin Trotsky. Their, their pictures were known. Their, their photographs were known. And I well remember during the Vietnam War, the American Communist Party built up the per person of Angela Davis, who was completely unknown. Her, her photograph, a, bla a black woman, it was seen everywhere. And it became recognizable, a recognizable symbol. Now, for the first time now, for the first time, we are beginning to do serious mass work. This means a dialogue with the masses, not the narrow layer of activists that we're used to dealing with. But uh, ordinary people who've never read any of our material, don't know us, don't know our, ide our ideas, and they have to be convinced. But for the first time that I can remember, there's a very broad audience of people that want to be convinced. And that's the most important point for us. That brings us back to the manifesto, and it brings us back to the purpose of this meeting. You know, We, we have this opportunity, which we must seize. And there is, there is a change. I've got here many, unfortunately, I won't have much time to deal with this, but if you'll allow me a moment, I've got a quote here somewhere. 
Where's he gone? Where's he gone? Where's he gone? Oh, yes, here you are. You know, this change, it's, we've understood it. Some of the more intelligent bourgeois strategists also are, be are beginning to understand. For example, there was just an article published in Britain a few weeks ago. And it is by a man called, what, Frost, David Frost, isn't it? David Frost, that's right. Now, where are we? I've lost my bloody page, as usual. Rob, you pinched my page. What have you done? No, never mind, never mind, never mind. Let's have a look. But where are we? Uh, and uh, he actually published an article with a title in, 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 in a right-wing bourgeois paper. The mood of the public, in, the, the public in Britain has developed a, a mood for revolution. This is the title of the article. The, 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 people, the people of Britain, he says, are in a revolutionary mood. Now, as it happens, I think that's a slight exaggeration. We're not quite there yet. But what this, uh, this leading Tory brother, leading conservative, what he says is, 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 is based on something. Now, for example, there's, there's an, an election taking place in Britain at the present time. And it is, the mood is very peculiar. On the one hand, the Tory government is hated, hated. What, what's the percentage they got now? Yeah, percentage. No, but what's the percentage? It's 12% or 25%. He does, he's supposed to know this guy. <laughs> what am I asking him for? The boss I think that the, the, the Tories, I don't think they got 25% of the, of, of the yeah, poll. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. At last, a, a, sens a sensible voice. What is it? Yeah. Speak up, comrade, I can you. The Tories in the polls now have got 17%. It's a catastrophic collapse. Yes, but at this, I don't know what they, what they get in the final vote, but it, it, it will be a catastrophic collapse. Yes, but there's no enthusiasm for Labour, no enthusiasm for Stammer whatsoever. And therefore, it's, it's a strange thing. Maybe quite a few people will abstain. I think it, at the, in the end, many people will vote Labour just to get rid of the Conservatives. That's possible. But this, this, uh, this thing, this uh, hostility to politics, Frost deals with this. You might think that's apathy. It's not apathy. And he explains, Frost says the following. The truth is, he says, that most voters pay almost no attention to politics apart from a few days around the election. He goes on. I don't blame them. It's absolutely rational and reasonable to do this. But it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, he says, out of lack of interest. It, this is his words. It happens because people have, have switched off, have switched off from the Westminster game of professional politicians. He says, this isn't apathy, it's a total loss of confidence in the system. This is a Tory leader speaking. And he's right. Uh, well, an, another pollster called James Frayne writes, I cannot remember a more disillusioned and angrier electorate. People are angry. Not just angry against the Conservatives either. They are angry. And uh, this, how would I express this? You see, people, most people, well, they haven't read any books, they don't know us, they don't know what we stand for. But most people feel in their heart, in their guts, they feel strongly that something in society is badly wrong, that this is not right, what, what's happening, it's not right. And this, this is what Trotsky, this is, the, this is actually the beginnings, the embryo, if you like, of revolutionary consciousness. It's what Trotsky expressed in a marvelous, profound phrase where he, refer, he referred to the molecular process of socialist revolution. That's it. In which you get, like in geology, this gradual build up and build up and build up of one thing and another thing and another thing, until eventually it, it, it expresses itself as a sudden change in consciousness. Sudden expression, which is a revolution. Now, what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, first of all, that enormous, in a period like this, enormous changes can and will occur when they are least expected. <laughs> Comrades, we must expect, we, yes, we must expect the unexpected, to put it uh, concretely, we must be prepared. Now, the radicalization is not confined to the students. You've got very significant developments taking place. You, you've had mass strikes, racist strikes in America. You have some very interesting public declarations by a man called uh, Sean Fain, who is the president of the, a, the, the UAW, which is, the that's the powerful, the United Auto Workers of America, very powerful union, who made the following statement. 
By the way, he supported the students against repression about the Palestine movement. His, his union organizes thousands and thousands of workers in the universities, by the way. He says, the U UAW will never support the mass arrest for intimidation of the, or, or intimidation of those exercising their right to protest, strike, or speak out against injustice. And so on, he goes on to say some other things. But on, on May Day, the same union, the, the UAW, released a video, <laughs> quite an extraordinary video, where this man actually calls for a general strike in America. He, he, he says the following. It's true that it's, it's, it's a peculiar thing. You might think it's strange, but it, it, there's an explanation for it. He says the following. We invite other unions to align their contract aspiration. I beg your pardon. To, to align their contract aspiration dates with our own. The, you, the, the state, American unions, they've got like contract dates which expire, expire at a certain time. And he's calling on all unions to unite their contracts with his union, which would, would, come, together on the would come together on the 1st of May 2028. But that's, the, that's when the contracts expire. But he says the following. I quote the actual words. We want a general strike. We want everyone walking out, just like they do in other countries. Together, we can begin to flex our collective muscle. Now, to be clear about it, this man is not a Marxist, and he's very confused, and he makes contradictory declarations. It's true. It's true. All that's true. But I can't remember the last time when a leader of a major American union made a statement like that. Can't remember. And that must surely represent something in the working class. The beginnings, the beginnings of something big in the United States. So therefore, I'm saying this movement is not just about Palestine. That's wrong. And we, our duty is to expand it to, to general demands for, for a revolutionary change of, of society. Now, you see, you have this colossal possibility. Of course, it's not uniform. Different layers of the class draw different conclusions at different times. And of course, at this stage, the most advanced layers is the youth. That's why we must base, base ourselves on the youth. Lenin said, he who has the youth has, has the future. Some people say, oh no, the working class, the, the unions and so on. The Labour Party, the unions. Comrades, my first observation is, the working class is not the unions, nor is it the Labour Party. And uh, I'll be clear. Let's be clear about it. We do not write off either the unions or the Labour Party. We don't do that. We don't make that sectarian mistake. And we will continue to work in these organizations and we'll continue to put demands on them as we always have done. That's what Lenin advocated very clearly. You know, one time when Ted, Ted Grant, uh, our leader and teacher and founder of this organization, towards the end of his life, he said to me, Alan, he said, I don't know why Lenin wrote so many books. Because nowadays nobody reads them, and if they do read them, they don't understand a single word of it. I think, I think that's quite fair, by the way. You see a, a general bankruptcy of this, and this is the point. You have all these possibilities, and who is who's giving, giving it an expression? Sometimes people talk about the mass organizations and the mass organizations. Well, okay. Don't worry, comrades. We, we are not going to forget about the mass organizations. We'll pay them due attention. But as Ted used to say, every vegetable has its season, okay? And if you ask me, what about now at this moment in time, in Britain, for example, the average trade union branch meeting, is that really a reflection of the mood of the working class? Well, I will leave it to our trade union comrades to answer that question. But in general, what I will say is this, and I insist on this, at this moment in time, this powerful mood this mood that exists in society, that the Tories have seen, that Dave Frost has seen, finds no expression in the mass organizations. Zero. By the way, that's not something that we, 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 we predicted years ago. We always assumed that the masses would turn in the first place to the mass organizations and that there would be the emergence of a left wing. Well, that can still happen. It happened in Britain unexpectedly with Corbyn, with Jeremy Corbyn, for a, for a short time, for a short time. And Jeremy and, and, and Corbyn could have changed the whole situation. He had it in his hand, in his power to do that. Hundreds of thousands of people were joining the Labour Party looking for a left alternative. What's the problem? 
The problem is one of leadership. The problem is one of the subjective factor. And Jeremy Corbyn, like all the left reformers, like the other guy, Bernie Sanders in the States, the same, same story, he had a possibility to set up a, a third party. But all these left reformists, in the last analysis, are not capable of, of, of conducting the struggle with the right wing to the end. That's the problem. They're afraid. They're afraid of the sound of their, their own, afraid of their own shadow. And they run away from a fight. They run away from a fight. That's the truth of the matter. Arguing that for the sake of unity, we mustn't have splits, we mustn't divide the movement, and nonsense of this sort. Instead of telling the truth, that the right wing reformers have no place in this movement because they're agents of the capitalist class. And they should be driven out, expelled and driven out with sticks and stones. No arguments. They didn't do that. They preached sweetness and light and all the rest of it. We must all love each other. And therefore, they handed the power in the Labour Party over to Starmer and the right wing, which was a crime. And of course, Starmer thanked them adequately for their betrayal, for their seller, that's what it was. It was a betrayal. He thanked them by kicking them out, all of them, and staging a vicious purge against the left wing. As, as a conscious and deliberate representative of, the, of capital, he understood what needed to be done. Get rid of the left. Where's the left? The left did not understand. And that's the, the problem with left reformism. And by the way, I'm not refer, when I refer to weakness, I'm not referring to this as a personal thing. Personal weakness, personal cowardice. No, nothing of the sort. This is not a personal question. It's not a psychological question. It's de embedded deeply into the, the, the uh, DNA of left reformism. Because in the last analysis, the left reformists do not have a fundamental disagreement with the right reformists, actually. Because they all accept the existence of the capitalist system, all of them. Only some are more conscious and deliberate, and others are completely utopian, actually, demanding that the, the capitalist system should be gradually reformed into something different, you know. And they, they, they have the insolence, they have the insolence to describe us communists as utopians, utopians. And they are realists. When they get realists, we must be realistic, you know. Comrades, please be realistic. Yeah. You know what sort of a realism, realism that is? It's the realism of a man who tries to teach a man-eating tiger to eat lettuce. You know. Have you ever, ever tried that? Have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried it? No? No. You should. You should, you know. Of course, you will not teach the, 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 the tiger to eat lettuce, but he will eat you. That's, that's the sort of... These, these fools. It's the worst form of utopianism. Reactionary utopianism. And we must uh, explain this in very clear language. But that phase of left reformism is finished. It's finished. As also finished in Greece with Cyprus, also finished in Spain with Podemos, it's finished. And therefore, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do in a situation like this? I mean, uh, it's a concrete question, not an abstract question at all. Of course, you've got the communist parties, which under the present circumstances, they should be growing rapidly everywhere. Well, they're experiencing, they get some, some growth only because they have the name communism. Now, the most important thing for us is that a very large number of young people, even very young people, the other day, the other day we received a very nice letter from a, a school kid in Britain. He's 12 years old, saying, I'm a communist and I would like to join your party. Will you please let me in? The only trouble might be my age. He said, 12 years old. That's, it's not a problem. It, Poll after poll has showed, in country after country, in America, in Canada, in Britain, even Australia, that there is a sizable number of young people who now consider themselves to be communists. These have drawn conclusions, the correct conclusions from the situation. And they conclude that nothing is good enough except communism. Even socialism, even the, the word socialism is no good, it's, it's not adequate. It smells of, of reformism and, frankly, of betrayal. No, no, no. These young people, they want communism. And therefore, it should be a, an easy task for us, if we are bold, we show the necessary determination to recruit these people. By the way, we are talking about, according to these figures, these percentage figures, we're talking about millions of young people. And there is, by the way, there's a huge vacuum now on the left, a huge vacuum. The so-called communist parties, 
Well, there's a problem with them, isn't it? It's a, sm a small difficulty, a small problem. They have nothing whatsoever to do with communism. They've abandoned communism. They've abandoned any, any, any pretense at standing for communism in the sense that Lenin understood the word. They don't understand it. They're communists in name only. I'm not referring to the rank and file. Doubtless there are many, many honest workers and youth in, the, in their ranks that we must address ourselves to. But in the great majority of cases, the leaders of these parties have long ago abandoned Leninist ideas and become a, another version of the social democracy of reformists, left reformists in the best, uh, in the best case. There are exceptions like the Ku Kuen in Greece that has definitely made progress, which we must consider. But in general, it's not the case. You know, other, other people like them. In Brazil, we had a very good relation with the communists there of, of Ivan Pinheiro and others. And we, we will maintain friendly relationships and discussions with them. But there's a lot more I could say, but I don't have the time. The question is, what conclusion can we draw from these things which I've described? What conclusion? In my view, there's only one conclusion is possible. We must now boldly strike out in a new direction and boldly raise the banner of a new party. Because frankly, young people, people don't understand anything else. They understand party. And for a communist international, a revolutionary communist international. And it, 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 it will be easy, not difficult, very easy to win these young people to our ranks. We can grow rapidly. We, we are growing rapidly. But I, here I must issue a word of warning. And it's a very serious warning. You see, once you, you win a young person, joins the party, that is not the end of the process. It's the beginning of a process. You win somebody, you don't just sit back and say, well, that's that job done. Let's win somebody else. You must win these young people. And you must educate them in theory, which still remains our fundamental task. It's no good winning a young person. Otherwise, otherwise, if you don't do that, I'll tell you what will happen. You get rapid growth. And at a certain point, these people will go through our fingers. We will lose them. You win them and you train them. And the two things are not contradictory. They're not contradictory. They must proceed at the same time. Absolutely at the same time. You know. The comments know, know that I like to quote the Bible. I must get one quote in. I got a few in, a few in the other day at the IEC. I sneak them in. But never mind about that. And you know what quote I'm going to give, don't you? You've heard it before, haven't you? And you're going to hear it again. Because repetition is the mother of learning. Look around at the, at the, the wretched state of all the sectarian idiots who pretend to be Trotskyists. It's just a lamentable spectacle. Like unto the man who builded his house upon the sand, and the wind came and the rain, and it beat upon that house, and the house fell, and great was the fall of it, and great was the fall of it, says the Bible. And it goes on to say, we must be like the, like the wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the wind came, and the rain, and it beat upon the house, and the house fell not, because it was built upon the rock. Of course, the rock which uh, Jesus Christ was referring to is the rock of religious faith, well, we have no place for religious faith. We, do, we don't need any such thing. But our rock is the solid rock of Marxist theory, which this international alone, alone, for decades has been fighting to maintain. That is what has guaranteed the success we've got at the moment. If we hadn't have educated a whole layer of cadres, we couldn't do the work we're doing now. And therefore, this important work must continue. It's an absolute priority. And there's no problem here. Commerce, I guarantee to you that among these young people that are looking for us, look, they're looking for us, yes, they're looking for this organization as I speak. There's a thirst for theory. They want, to, they want to learn. They want to know. And we have to provide these wonderful ideas which we possess because that is our real strength. In fact, it's the only thing that entitles us to exist as an independent movement, the strength of these ideas. And therefore, comrades, we can be fully confident, fully confident in the correctness of these ideas. It's been fully demonstrated. We can have every confidence, full confidence. Le leave the pessimism to the circus clowns. Leave them alone. <laughs> Let them drown in their own sea of misery. For our part, we have complete confidence. Confidence in our ideas. 
the wonderful ideas of Marxism, as Lenin said, Marxism is all powerful because it is true. And that is very true. Confidence in the ideas, confidence in the working class, the only class that can change society. Confidence in the millions of young people that are looking for communism, they're looking for our organization. And last but not least, confidence in ourselves, the only people that have maintained the banner of communism under difficult conditions, and the only people that can succeed in building the necessary organization nationally and internationally, which is, which is the only ultimate guarantee of success in the struggle of the workers to change society. Comrades, long live Marxism, long live communism, long live the revolutionary communist international. Yesterday night, uh, the French President Macron uh, announced the dissolution of the National Assembly. Uh, new elections will be, hold, uh, will be held in uh, three weeks' time. This is a consequence of the results of the European election yesterday. Which was a complete rout uh, for Macron's party. Uh, less than 15% in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, 48% of abstention. And it was a big victory for the extreme right wing party of Marine Le Pen. <laughs> who got uh, nearly 32. And so Macron had no other option, really, but to dissolve the National Assembly. <coughs> because you have to remember uh, <laughs> that uh, it doesn't have an absolute majority in the National Assembly. It's been the case for two years. <laughs> And, and the vote of no confidence was uh, on the order of the day in the, in the following uh, weeks or, or even days. So Macron decided to anticipate and uh, to pretend to control the process. It must be said that Macron tried his best to avoid this electoral uh, defeat, wrote. <laughs> but after seven years of economic crisis, <laughs> of severe counter reforms, <laughs> of cuts in the public, massive cuts in public spendings, <laughs> of the systematic destruction of the public services, of repression in the streets, of inflation, etc., of supporting uh, Israel. Macron could not, could not convince many people to vote for his party. So he tried his, his last card. Uh, two months ago, he announced that, uh, insisted that he would, uh, he would send the French troops on the ground in Ukraine. And he even threatened Russia with a nuclear war. Of course, it's not just an electoral uh, tactic. The, 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 the interest of French imperialism are, are involved there, especially because uh, imperialism is, is in decline, is in crisis in Africa especially. But re Macron had no choice but to insist on that in the hope that it would mobilize uh, some, uh, some people to vote for him on the nationalist line. This crazy move was not very successful among NATO leaders, but nor was it very successful among uh, French voters, who did not enjoy the perspective of a nuclear war with uh, Russia, as you can understand. No, now, why, why has Le Pen party um, won the, the European election? It's quite simple, because the so-called left is, uh, is in, uh, in a deep crisis. The deep crisis uh, Alan has uh, referred to, uh, the crisis of reformism, Alan mentioned in, in his lead-off, explained. The Socialist Party, the Greens, the Communist Party, they have spent most of their times attacking not the right-wing and the extreme right-wing parties, not the, the ruling class, 
But Mélenchon party, the, leaders, the leader of the communist, French Communist Party, went as far as uh, calling uh, Mélenchon an anti-Semite publicly. And the Greens and the SP didn't deny. They do the same. They, 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 they sing the same song. They have completely capitulated to the, the bourgeois pressure on every question, starting with uh, the Gaza war. As for Mélenchon, who had uh, accumulated for some support on the left for, during the, the, the last five, ten years, he has spent most of his time in the, during the two last years uh, calling for the unity of the left. That is the unity with the Communist Party, the Greens, and the Socialist Party that calling him, are calling him an anti-Semite and, and everything else. The whole thing is a complete circus that an average workers cannot understand what's going on. Um, and this crisis of the reformists is, is what opened the, the road for the, the success, electoral successes of the Ma, uh, Marine Le Pen's party, the, the extreme right-wing party. Now, there is a good chance that uh, this party will win the next uh, general elections in uh, three uh, weeks' time. Uh, all the surveys uh, say that. Uh, the traditional bourgeois party, the Républicains, is, since yesterday, is clearly moving in the direction of a government of coalition with uh, Marine Le Pen. They said there is no, they said to Macron, we will never go into a coalition government with you. But they didn't say they wouldn't go, wouldn't go with a government of coalition with Le Pen, which says everything. And some MPs are already calling for a coalition government with the extreme right-wing party. All the right-wing parties together, they have a chance to, to win this election precisely because the left is so pathetic and because Mélenchon uh, uh, doesn't want to break with the right-wing reformists. This, this is something we explain often, that the left reformists, left wing of reformists, they, don't, they, are, they are unable to break with the right wing reformists. And it's perfectly clear in the case of France, Mélenchon is afraid, you can see, he's afraid of being the dominant force on the left. He needs someone on his right. And he's ready to artificially keep these people alive while they're dying instead of being alone on the left. But a victory of uh, uh, the, the right and the extreme right uh, next month, and a government led by uh, Marine Le Pen's party, will only prepare a new and sharp turn to the left. Already the youth is getting more and more radicalized, as everywhere. Yesterday night, there were spontaneous demonstrations of, of young people in many cities, or at least in Paris, I don't know about many cities, but Paris, probably elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and the victory of, of Marine Le Pen would be a, a, a source of destabilization, instability, political, but in the streets also. The youth will, would, uh, would mobilize. Uh, recently, a survey, a survey was, uh, was done among the, the young people of French young people between 18 and 24 years old. They were asked, who would you vote for if the a presidential election was organized tomorrow? 40% said Mélenchon. And 10% said for one of these extreme right, uh, left-wing parties, uh, big sects on the left. And among those who said we, they would vote for Mélenchon, there's a lot of them are very critical of Mélenchon already, but they would vote for him because he is the only one who can uh, win at this stage. And for the French section of the international, it's perfectly clear. We are going to build the organization in this layer, this layer of young people moving far, far to the left. And this is where we're going to build the Revolutionary Communist Party that will be founded next November. Thank you. So comrades, the U.S. is the most powerful imperialist country in the world, but as Trotsky said, it's a giant with clay feet. The serious crisis inside the United States, including economic and political, bourgeois institutions uh, are, are hated and the illusions that the working class used to have in these institutions are starting to burn away. There's enormous anger against Joe Biden, who, as Alan said, is now known as Genocide Joe for his uh, support of Israel in, in the uh, war on Gaza. This anger, for example, plays out in a state like Michigan, which has a very large Arab American population. Many of these people will not vote for either of these candidates. This probably means that Michigan would therefore vote for Trump, which would help Trump get elected. There's, there's no way I could see Biden getting reelected without Michigan. Even if Trump doesn't get more votes than Biden, he can win in the Electoral College because that is biased to the rural petty bourgeois states. 
Now, the ruling class is trying to scare people. They're trying to say if, by, if uh, Trump gets elected, he's going to establish a dictatorship. But if Trump gets elected, it's not going to be a dictatorship. It's going to open up a period of extreme instability, political, social, and otherwise. We, we can guarantee that uh, the first night he gets elected, there are going to be protests in the streets, particularly among the youth. Now, some comrades have seen that Trump was convicted a few weeks ago. Now, Trump, Trump said that the judicial system was rigged against him. Now, the, tr the, the truth is the judicial system is rigged against the working class, is rigged against the labor movement, is rigged against racial minorities, but it's not rigged against Trump. Trump has been breaking the law for decades and they never went after him until he started to interfere with the plans of the ruling class. J just for those comrades who ask, uh, Trump can run and win and be elected to president even if he's in jail, which I don't expect he will be. Conditions in the United States uh, are producing anger and producing uh, um, uh, an, 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 an increase in class struggle. About 9 million Americans work two or more jobs to make ends meet, and 78% of Americans work paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> Four and a half years ago, what would have cost you a dollar now costs almost two dollars. Homelessness is at record levels in the United States today. According to the government figures, which I don't think are, I think they underestimate the problem, homelessness just in New York City is up 175% over the last 20 years. And homelessness around the country, um, they estimate that uh, at least 650,000 people live in either shelters, tents, cars, or just outdoors. Even small towns now, they have areas where there are people who live in tents, and then the police come and arrest them. This has created a rise in the class struggle where, where according to polls, 70 percent of the, the population approves of unions in the United States. Major strikes have increased like uh, from 2022 to 2023 went from 43. It, it jumped 43 percent. That included big strikes like the writer's strike, the actor strike and the auto workers strike. Also, there have been efforts to organize the unorganized like at Amazon auto factories in the South, Apple and Starbucks. But these organizing campaigns have had mixed results. And the reason is the American ruling class has set up these laws and they said, you want to organize a union, you have to follow these laws. The problem is the laws are written so that you will not be able to establish a union at that particular workplace. The US labor movement has dealt with this problem before. Like for example, back in 1934, that year, Trotskyists in Minneapolis, the American Workers Party in Toledo, Ohio, and the Communist Party in San Francisco all led successful organizing campaigns and strikes. Those campaigns were successful because they didn't obey the law. They relied on mass action, mobilizing and, and, and organizing the masses, not just the strikers, but support around the strikers. The U.S. labor movement is going to have to relearn and rediscover those traditions and use them in the future if it wants to be successful. In, in that context, as Alan explained, the anger from below has created some changes in the union leadership. Sean Fain is the new leader of the United Auto Workers Union, and he has uh, made uh, some, some, some uh, positive improvements. His union um, supported a resolution uh, calling for a ceasefire in the war in Gaza. They, they also took a harder line in the auto negotiations that uh, occurred last fall. He started a campaign to organize the unorganized auto factories in the South. And as Alan said, he's uh, put out a call for unions to um, try to get their contracts to expire before May Day 2028 linking this with a call for a general strike on that May Day. We are going to use these, uh, these points in our work. We're going to advocate, certainly, in our, our comrades in the unions, that they uh, uh, get their union to have an expiration date on April 30th, 2028, and connect that with a, with a call for a general strike and to show the, the power of the labor movement in the United States, if it did go on a general strike, what it could accomplish. But unfortunately, we also have to show the limitations of, of, of someone like Sean Fain. For, for example, in the, auto, in the auto strike last fall, he implemented this idea of a stand-up strike, which meant only some workers went out on strike while others continued working. 
if he had taken all the workers out and then tried to spread the strike to, to related industries, uh, especially when the actors and the, and the writers were on strike at the same time, more could have been gained from that contract. He, he's also trying to organize the unorganized auto factories in the South, but he's doing it according to the government rules, which led them to have one victory at Volkswagen, but a defeat at the Mercedes plant. We'll see how the campaign uh, um, plays out, but it's going to be harder and harder for him to succeed in these other plants that are located in the South. <laughs> the, the biggest mistake he made was he uh, took the UAW and endorsed Joe Biden for re-election. In fact, at the meeting, at the union meeting where they held, where they had Joe Biden there, uh, there were members who were protesting his policy uh, in Gaza, and the union actually security like were, were uh, repressing their own members from this protest. So, so it's a contradictory process. On the one hand, he's taken a lot of steps forward, but there are also some uh, negative steps as well. But this also leads us to this uh, movement that's developed on the campuses to fight against the war in Gaza. Now it's interesting, this started at some elite schools, Ivy League schools like Columbia University in New York. But it didn't just stay there, it spread to other private universities and public universities as well. <laughs> One of the most interesting developments was that at UCLA, which is a public college in, in, in uh, California, the peaceful student protesters were attacked by Zionist right-wing elements, the police and the, and the campus security. Mark says that sometimes the revolution needs the whip of reaction. And this is what happened in this instance. Uh, this is what happened in this instance because uh, the, uh, the, one of the UAW locals that represents university workers decided to take a political strike in reaction to this. <laughs> and you don't see political strikes very often recently in the United States. Comrades, my time has expired, but I want to say the United States working class must build its party, a mass communist party. This will involve many steps and stages, but the first step is the founding of the RCI, and this July when we found the Revolutionary Communists of America. <laughs> Comrades, this is a fantastic beginning of this marvelous uh, conference and uh, extraordinary introduction uh, given by Alan on the manifesto of uh, newly formed RCI. Each and, uh, each and every participant of this historic event, uh, uh, either in this hall or uh, on uh, internet or online, uh, deserve congrat congratulations. I want to intervene on the question of ex-colonial countries. People may ask what does this international offer to the workers of the ex-colonial or as they are named, uh, the backward countries. So to understand the solution, it is necessary to understand the fundamental causes of the problem. So the question is why backward countries are backward. We are Leninists and Trotskyites and we believe in the theory of permanent revolution. There are so many aspects, but uh, there are two basic reasons of the backwardness of the backward countries. First, incompetency and barbarism of the local uh, uh, ruling class classes. And second, loot, plunder, slaughter, exploitation, and oppression of not the working classes of the uh, advanced countries, but the ruling classes of the imperialist countries. The pathetic and miserable post-colonial intellectuals of third world see the advanced capitalist countries as a single block and consider them with the, uh, without the differentiation of classes oppressor as a whole. This is the blunder and ideological bankruptcy of this corrupt intelligentsia. These ideas are, are also being promoted in the universities of advanced countries just to derail the class consciousness. They uh, labeled Marxism as Eurocentric. On the other hand, some left intellectuals in the West also uh, blame or put responsibility of the backwardness of these backward countries on the working classes of, the, of these countries. This is simply ridiculous, in fact criminal and can be called the contempt of the working class in general. Because the ruling classes and intelligentsia of 
these backward countries also abuse their own working classes for their backwardness and at this point these left intellectuals shares the ideas of these rotten rotten people no communist can ever blame the working class for cultural backwardness as marx and engels explained that who owns the uh, means of production owns the mental production as well the ruling classes and the so called intelligentsia of the poor countries along with their imperialist masters should be blamed for this uh, backwardness by the way question of culture is not so simple it is very complex culture is a superstructure dialectically dependent on its economic foundations some advanced nations can be culturally more backward than economically backward uh, nations so th this international thing that the interests of sindhis pashtuns bloch kurd arab working classes and the interest of british french german and american working classes may apparently and immediately be different but organically and essentially they are unified crisis of capitalism once again highlighted the national question globally and complexity of national question in, is increased rise of economic nationalism and trade wars expressing the national prejudices of the ruling classes of imperialist nations on the other hand scottish irish catalans etc and the black question in the advanced countries reflects the frustration of middle classes and the fragmented and disoriented layers of working classes in backward countries small nations and nationalities are exploited and oppressed brutally and struggling for their basic democratic rights we sport their right of self determination but this is not an abstract sport and this sport is conditioned by the uh, as a whole balance of force uh, class forces and is subordinate uh, subordinated by the interests of global labor movement as the whole we believe only the working classes of the oppressed nations with the global class solidarity can liberate the oppressed nations middle classes are petty bourgeois of these nations has the illusions in the so called world fraternity and united nations and the institutions like united nations we strongly believe that the institutions like united nations are the puppets of us and western imperialism and in all important global disputes they played the role of brothels in reality gaza war is the latest example they are the mere spectators of this genocide many uh, nationalist nationalists like pashtun and baloch nationalists in pakistan usually lose this battle because of this illusion few months back we witnessed the marvelous baloch uprising in pakistan that mobilized millions of oppressed balochs under the leadership of young girls the fundamental demand of movement was abandonment of enforced disappearances and now two weeks ago the leadership of that movement visited norway and us and received resistance so called resistance awards meanwhile the abduction of baloch students not only continued but increased by pakistani state so this is a historic law these petty bourgeois uh, leaderships are destined to betray their ranks rank and file their supporters ask us if not united nation that what is the alternate solution we want to tell them that you can see this conference and this international is the reply to all of them what does this conference mean this is on one hand a message to the global working class and true freedom fighters that now the isolated uh, movements and resistance can be uh, gathered can be collected on one platform to fight for the emancipation of the human race and at the same time this conference is ultimatum to the imperialists and the global ruling classes that you are killing our children your wars civil wars are destroying human race to end these imperialist wars to to end these inhuman wars civil wars and slaughters and to wage the only war for which one can die with pride with smiling face that is the class war and in fact not to wage because that war is uh, going on already but to win decisively this class war communists are coming One of the main characteristics of the world situation is the enormous instability and turbulence in world relations. We look around the world and we see regional wars, 
not just in Ukraine and uh, the massacre in Gaza, which are in the highlight, in, in the spotlight, in the, in the headlines, but many other local and regional wars in which thousands, tens of thousands of people are being killed and they don't even make it into the headlines. One of the main reasons we need to, we need to un try to understand why this is. And I will say that one of the main reasons is the crisis of capitalism. The struggle between different imperialist powers for the loot is, becomes aggravated when the loot becomes smaller. This is something that, that Lenin already explained in, in his book, uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. But there is another important factor that we have been explaining for some time. And that is the relative decline of the power of U.S. imperialism. After the fall of Stalinism in the Soviet Union in 1989-91, the world seemed dominated by one major superpower which could face no competition. And that was supposed to be a source of stability. The ruling class were very optimistic. They famously said, we have won. And they even, in their wild optimism, they went on to talk about the peace dividend. That is, how the money that had been squandered in military spending up until that time will now be used for social spending, housing, healthcare, and education. But that, but that was not to be as, as could have been predicted. But it is true that at that time the power of U.S. imperialism was completely unmatched. I am, I am old enough to remember the 1991 Gulf War. And at that time, and at that time. The U.S. imperialism went to war against uh, Iraq to defend its imperialist interests. But it did so under the banner of the United Nations. At the U.N. Security Council, Russia voted in favor of the invasion. And China merely abstained. But of course, we all know how uh, the, the, the war in uh, Iraq ended up. That one and the following one. And in the intermediate period, there's been a massive change in the balance of forces of the different imperialist powers. The United States in 1960 represented 40% of the world's GDP. And it has now gone down to 24% of the world's GDP. Imperialism is first and foremost an economic uh, relation. And militarism, military spending, foreign military adventures is a consequence of, of that. And in the meantime, in the meantime, we have seen the rise of new imperialist uh, powers. Particularly China, which has gone from 4% of the world's GDP in 1960 to 16%. And is now competing on, on, on uh, the world scale for the control of uh, trade routes, markets, spheres of influence and fields of investment. This has created, uh, this change in the world situation has created enormous confusion, particularly in the so-called communist uh, movement, with wildly different positions, but with some some arguing that China is still a socialist country of some of some sort. And that therefore it plays a progressive role in the world scene. But if you ask the working people of Sri Lanka, Congo or Ecuador, you will get a completely different answer. To be chained by the, by the chains of debt and investment to U.S. imperialism is fundamentally no different to, than to be chained to, the, to Chinese imperialism. 
estar encadenado a deuda, inversiones, encadenado al inferior. There are others who argue that the so-called multipolar world is a progressive development that needs to be defended and promoted. And we decisively reject that uh, foolish uh, idea because there is no fundamental difference between there being one single imperialist power which exercises its domination almost unhindered and there being a struggle between different imperialist powers which uh, then becomes a struggle for markets and eventually also becomes a, a, a struggle that is waged through war. China is clearly not yet in a position to defy the power of the United States from a military point of view anywhere in the world. But China is certainly starting to flex its muscles also on the military scene, particularly around its own uh, borders in the question of Taiwan, the South China, Ch China Sea and so on. And this struggle between different imperialist powers has already led to wars, military coups, and regime change in a number of Central African countries, with the direct involvement of Russia, which is also an imperialist power, although, although not on the same level as China. So therefore, rather than being anything progressive in this, a multipolar world, if anything, means more instability, more turbulence, wars, military coups, and struggles for influence, which the working people around the world pay the price of. But we need, to be, we need to be careful with this as well, because it remains the case that the United States is still the most powerful and therefore the most reactionary imperialist power on Earth. The decline, the decline of the United States as an imperialist power is only relative, and we must stress that. In terms of military spending, the United States is the first country in the world and accounts for 40% of all military spending. And that is more than the, than the combined military spending of the next 10 countries on the list. In any other, in any other circumstances, the struggle between uh, a declining uh, imperialist power and, and rising, new rising imperialist powers will have led to open war already. At the moment, at the moment, this is expressing itself in trade wars, tariff, retaliatory tariff barriers, but also, but also in the form of, uh, in the form of proxy wars like the war in uh, Ukraine clearly is. Most, uh, and the reason why this has not led to a world war yet, uh, we, don't think, uh, we don't think that this is likely, is the, the existence of uh, nuclear weapons, which uh, all these different uh, military uh, imperialist powers possess. Capitalists do not, do not wage war for the fun of it, but in order to uh, acquire uh, spheres of influence, markets, and so on. And a war, and a war involving nuclear weapons will destroy, will, will destroy most of the planet and will leave a situation in which no one will be able to make any profits. But this situation has led, as I said before, to enormous confusion amongst uh, the left. We have seen in the case of Ukraine, for instance, the different communist parties collapsing into uh, absurd uh, positions. Some of them supporting their own uh, uh, bourgeois at home, like the Communist Party of the Russian Federation supporting the reactionary imperialist uh, policy of Putin. But also, but also many communist parties in the West supporting Western imperialism and NATO in a more open or covert uh, way. Under the, under the so-called argument that this is a struggle for Ukrainian uh, self-determination. <laughs> Precisely at the time when Ukraine has, been, has become a, a complete colony of the West, where, where Western imperialist powers pay even the, the national budget with which they pay the civil servants and all, all the national expenditure. And others, others still have uh, collapsed into uh, petty bourgeois, useless petty bourgeois pacifism, both in relation to Ukraine and in relation to Gaza, where they say, oh, the United Nations should intervene, there should be respect for international law, a position that a position that a hundred years ago Lenin uh, completely demolished in his writings about World War One.
Perhaps, perhaps most scandalously, the position of the so-called Fourth International, which has no nothing to do with the Fourth International, with Trotsky or with Trotskyism, which adopted the position of uh, arms for Ukraine and uh, sanctions on Russia, a position of full support for Western imperialism and NATO in this conflict. <laughs> on this question, we need to go back to the principles. We're not, in this discussion, we're not just analyzing the world situation. We are discussing the manifesto on which we are founding the Revolutionary Communist International. And therefore, we, we not only analyze, but we also explain clearly where we stand and what is our program. And our program is based on two key principles on the question of war. One, the main enemy of the working class is at home. The main enemy of the working class is our own ruling class. And number, number two, in order to achieve peace, in order to put an end to war, you need to overthrow capitalism and imperialism, which is its highest uh, stage. There's no, uh, no way that you can achieve war or a ceasefire by appealing to the big powers, to the good heartedness and so on. And my final point is this, the question of war and particularly the question of military spending is now becoming a, a, a key political question in all countries, particularly in the NATO countries which are now engaging in a, in a campaign of, of uh, increasing military spending, re reintroducing or reinforcing national service, conscription, military service, and so on, in different countries. And, and we need to respond to this in a clear way by fighting against militarism from a socialist point of view, not from a pacifist point of view, and by putting the question in the following terms, that they have money for war and for defense spending, but these people are the same people who do, that do claim that there is no money for education, for health care, and for housing, and so on. And this, this is the basis on which we build our position in relation to imperialist war. <laughs> Uh, okay, comrades, uh, it's Adam from Britain. Uh, I don't actually want to speak too much on Britain, though, because there's a session later in the week uh, specifically on uh, Britain. But I want to touch on a key feature of British politics that I think uh, demonstrates a wider point that's raised in the manifesto. And which has important consequences for our perspectives and for our tasks. Comrades may know that there's an election going on in Britain right now. In Britain, you'd be forgiven if you didn't know this. Or more accurately, if you knew about it, but you just didn't care. Because none of the main parties or politicians are offering anything. La Labour's program and slogan can be summed up as Me Too. Tory say austerity. And Starmer says, me too. And so on and so forth. Now, it's Fiona's campaign is resonating because it's such a breath of fresh air in this otherwise stale, stinking political atmosphere. Because there's such a political vacuum in British politics. Such a hatred towards the entire establishment. Combined with such an utter criminal silence from the reformists and the left. And I think this is actually one of the defining, most generalized features of the period everywhere. This vast chasm between the objective situation and the subjective factor. Between what's necessary, what's demanded, and what's on offer from the so-called left or workers' leaders. We can see how totally inadequate these leaders are on every front. Politically, we've seen the failure of Corbyn and Sanders of Syriza and Podemos, of Boric in Chile or Petro in Colombia. Industrially, we've seen strike waves and militant action 
achieved very few victories in the US, in Britain, because of these leaders. And obviously on the question of Gaza, they have no solution, no strategy beyond vain calls for, uh, for a ceasefire and, and repeated marches. And this really emphasizes what we mean when we say that the crisis of capitalism is a crisis of reformism. As Alan and others have pointed out, this is a school, the school of reformism that workers will have to go through and experiencing all these limits and betrayals. These events will put every leader, every party, every idea, every tendency to the test. But I think it's no exaggeration to say that there is nobody but us who has the ideas, the program and the methods required. The problem is we're too small. We're not big enough yet to make a decisive impact on events. And so until we are, this political vacuum will continue. We often say in nature, and the same is true in politics, that nature abhors a vacuum. There's this burning hatred towards the traditional parties but no proper alternative from the left. And so what we're seeing in many countries now are, are all sorts of weird and wonderful political phenomena and movements that are sprouting up to partially fill this vacuum. Acting for a temporary period as a, as a lightning rod for all the anger in society or giving a distorted expression to the discontent. And we've seen that such phenomena can take on all sorts of forms. We've seen the global movements like Black Lives Matter, the, the climate strikes, uh, the Gaza encampments. We've seen movements uh, of farmers even across Europe in recent months, or the Gilets Jaunes in France in recent years. In Britain, in this election, we like to see many anti-war, anti-establishment protest votes. People like George Galloway, who won in Rochdale a few months ago. In, in the past, this same moved, move, uh, mood coalesced around the national question in Scotland and even Brexit in some parts. In Spain, we've seen the explosion of the socialist movement in the Basque country, in Catalonia and elsewhere. And in a number of countries, I think we've even seen comedians and celebrities becoming a kind of political reference point. I even think Zelensky was a comedian, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Although I don't think he's laughing now. But we've, even, we've got to recognize that even monstrous figures like Trump uh, reflect this anti-establishment mood in a distorted way. This is important to recognize that consciousness is contradictory. It develops dialectically in swings and leaps, not in a straight line. And the worst thing we can do when confronted with uh, a figure like Trump or, or some of these farmers' movements is to write these uh, layers off as backward and reactionary, just as the liberals do. I say these, these movements and phenomena I've described, they have lots of differences. But I think they have two things in common. Firstly, they have a very politically confused and contradictory character without any clear program. Secondly, they are accidental and ephemeral. Uh, they, they're very temporary. They sprout up and then subside within weeks or even days sometimes. And the important conclusion for us from that uh, understanding is that we have to get stuck in straight away in these kind of movements when they sprout up. We have to intervene rapidly and boldly and flexibly to try and recruit the best layers who are drawn into these movements. And not take some sort of sectarian approach where we sit on the sidelines criticizing these movements for not having the perfect program.
Of course such movements have confused demands. We can't expect anyone to have a fully worked out revolutionary program from the outset. And in fact, even our own program is not fully formed and perfectly defined in advance. It's formed and refined through practice, through intervening, through opening up a dialogue with the people in these movements. Just take the example of the student encampment protests. Boycott and divestment was not our demand. It's not part of our program normally. But it was a real living movement with real demands that we had to connect with and try and broaden out and generalize in the way that Geordie's just described. Got to recognize that any genuine mass struggle will have a contradictory character involving very heterogeneous layers and ideas. As Lenin summarized it, who who wishes to see a pure revolution will never live to see one. So our job is, is not to sneer and fixate on the negatives when, we are, when we're confronted with uh, phenomena like these. It's to try and get to the essence of what these represent. Discard the secondary features. Separate out the progressive from the reactionary and accentuate the positives. And then skillfully link these to the general needs, the general uh, demands that are required by history. This is the transitional method, the transitional uh, demands, the, transmit, the transmit, transitional program. Linking the particular demands of the movement to the general needs. I think we can summarize it by saying that what we really need to do is learn to listen and learn to think. I think this is what Lenin would do if he was confronted by any of these phenomena today. And I think if we can do this, patiently explain, we can become that lightning rod. We will become that catalyst, that reference point for radicalized workers and youth. Only with a very important difference from all the other phenomena and movements that I've just described. We will be able to offer those workers and youth a Bolshevik cadre organization to join. An organization that can turn this anger into a material force capable of transforming society. Hemos explicado que la crisis del capitalismo también se expresa como una crisis del reformismo. We've said that the crisis of capitalism is also a crisis of reformism. Y creo que América Latina en los últimos años da ejemplos muy concretos de ello. And Latin America is full of examples of this from the last uh, period. Incluso uno de los procesos más avanzados como el, el que puede ser Venezuela eh, ha llegado a una catástrofe. Even one of even the the country that went the furthest, uh, that is Venezuela, uh, ended up in in catastrophe. Chavez eh, dijo, señaló que era necesario ir a, al socialismo. Sin embargo, la revolución se quedó a, me, a medio camino. Chavez said that uh, the the revolution should lead to socialism, but the revolution was not completed. Y lo único que ha ocurrido es que se ha alterado el propio funcionamiento del capitalismo y hoy tenemos eso un desastre. Uh, and what what happened in the end is that uh, capitalism was only meddled with for uh, uh, slightly, and uh, and this has led to disaster. Millions of Venezuelans, especially young people, are fleeing from the country. And the, the rise of uh, Millet in Argentina is, uh, is uh, closely connected to the failure of Kitchenerism in, in, in that country. We see that, uh, that uh, the old order is, uh, is in crisis, all the old parties are falling apart. Pero las nuevas expresiones, los movimientos reformistas de mil matices, no logran solucionar las contradicciones del sistema. 
But the new political forces, those uh, different reformist uh, movements that have emerged, are incapable of solving the problems. Pero este ascenso de la ultraderecha, como en el caso de Milei en Argentina, o antes lo que vimos con Bolsonaro en Brasil, no son movimientos firmes, sino muy inestables. Uh, but uh, the rise of these new far-right forces like Milei in Argentina or Bolsonaro previously in Brazil are, are, are very unstable movements. The working class in Argentina is uh, footing the, the bill for this uh, catastrophe, but uh, even there we see that uh, entire communities and the working class are fighting back. Incluso en el caso donde podemos ver a la, a la derecha o a la ultraderecha eh, con cierta base social como es en El Salvador, a la larga esta solidez no se ve bien. Uh, and even in countries where the right wing seems to have a more solid uh, basis, like in El Salvador, in the long term, this will prove not to be so. Bukele has been, has been able temporarily to put an end to violence, and that has garnered him uh, mass support. Y las masas están sufriendo la parte económica. Tienen ilusiones en que la situación va a cambiar. Y este buque le dice que sí va a venir un segundo milagro y que la situación va a cambiar en el país. Uh, but the masses have all sorts of uh, expectations about uh, the economy that uh, that Bukele is uh, is uh, is fostering. Y, y bueno, evidentemente que esto no va a ser así. But obviously those uh, expectations will be will will not uh, materialize. Eh, pero vemos otros procesos del reformismo donde todavía tiene una base de apoyo, como es el caso de Colombia o México o Honduras. Uh, in, in other countries, reformism has a, a, a base of support, as in, uh, in, in Colombia or in Honduras, y en México, ¿no? and, and in Mexico. Y bueno, lo que vemos con los reformistas es que tienen una enorme desconfianza en las masas y se apoyan y fortalecen al Estado burgués para poder gobernar. And what we see is that the reformists do not trust uh, the masses, so they lean on the state apparatus and they strengthen it uh, so as to be able to govern. Movilizan a las masas como un medio de presión para corregir o hacer avanzar al Estado o, o frenar un poco a la derecha. Uh, they only mobilize the masses in order to put pressure on the, on the state or to, or to scare the, the right wing. Eh, pero bueno, si uno mira las cifras de México, parecería como que es una excepción histórica. ¿no? If you look at the figures coming from Mexico, you might think that this is a, a historical exception. El domingo pasado hubo elecciones y los reformistas, el movimiento obradorista, eh, ganó de manera avasalladora las elecciones. Uh, last uh, Sunday there were elections and the, the left, the, the obradorista uh, movement, won a, a crushing victory. López Obrador va a terminar con una enorme autoridad y eso se reflejó en los resultados electorales. López Obrador ended his term with uh, enjoying an almost uh, authority and that was reflected in the, in, in the ballot box. Su candidata Claudia Sheinbaum ganó con el 59%. His uh, candidate Claudia Sheinbaum won with 59% of the vote. Y 33 millones de votos. That is uh, 33 million votes. Eh, López Obrador hace seis años ganó con el 52% de apoyo y 30 millones de votos. López Obrador, six years ago, won with uh, 52% uh, of, uh, of the vote. ¿Y cuántos votos? 30. And 30 million votes. Eh, el apoyo no se ha reducido sino que se incrementó. That means that uh, the, his support has not, uh, has not uh, fallen, but has increased, in fact. La candidata de la derecha, la verdad es que daba vergüenza, una tipa inepta capaz de perder votos por su ineptitud. Uh, the, the right-wing candidate was uh, ridiculous and completely uh, useless and, and lost a lot of votes because of that. Pero es la candidata que merecía la derecha. Es un reflejo de la clase a la que está representando de manera directa. But this uh, candidate was a faithful representative of the class that she uh, represents. Ella obtuvo 27% de votos. She got 27% of the vote. Y una tercera fuerza que captó a jóvenes que no están a favor de los políticos, captó 10%. And a third uh, party that is, uh, um, that is connected to the youth got, got 10% of the votes. Y bueno, esto se debe a, a distintos factores. And this owes to different factors. 
por un lado, hay un, la gente conoce lo que fueron los partidos de la burguesía y no quiere ese re regreso al pasado. Uh, people know uh, what the parties of the ruling class are like and they don't want to, uh, to, uh, go, um, to go back to the, to the, the past. Millones de familias reciben apoyos económicos de parte de, del gobierno de López Obrador. Millones de uh, familias están recibiendo beneficios de la gobierno López Obrador. Government. López Obrador diariamente tiene una conferencia de prensa y tiene un diálogo directo con seguidores. Y López Obrador también cultiva una conexión conexión con sus seguidores a través de sus conferencias La situación económica parece estable. No hay, no hay gran inflación, por ejemplo. El peso es fuerte. The economic uh, situation uh, seems to be uh, stable. There is no, there is no uh, inflation is not high and the peso is strong. Pero si miramos al fondo, lo que está ocurriendo es que hay una ligación mucho más fuerte a la economía de Estados Unidos, una ligación y una subordinación. But if we scratch beneath the surface, we will see that what is really happening is that the economy is becoming completely interlinked and subordinated to the United States. El crecimiento económico, las nuevas industrias están ligadas a las industrias fuertes de Estados Unidos. Uh, economic growth and the new uh, industries that are developing are, are connected to, to U.S. Uh, industry. Y México sigue siendo uno de los países más desiguales de, del planeta, donde siguen los multimillonarios haciéndose multimillonarios. And Mexico remains one of the most unequal societies uh, uh, in the world, where the multimillionaires are becoming even richer. Hay problemas que muestran de manera clara también el fracaso del reformismo, como es el tema de la violencia. And there are other additional problems that show the bankruptcy of reformism, such as the, the, the question of violence. En el gobierno de López Obrador ha habido más asesinatos que en los sexenios pasados. Uh, during uh, López Obrador's term in office, uh, um, the murder rate uh, went, went up, actually. La cifra es de 155 uh, mil homicidios. Y hay más de 110 mil personas desaparecidas. There, are one, there were 155,000 record, recorded uh, murders and 110,000 uh, disappeared people. Hay una enorme descomposición social que también se expre expresa con el auge del crimen organizado. There is a, a situation of social decomposition that is reflected in the rise of, uh, of organized crime. Las masas tienen una ilusión gradualista de que, bueno, no todo se soluciona en seis años. Hoy avanzamos un poco y seguiremos avanzando. Uh, the masses are, are patient and have the illusion that, uh, that we are making gradual uh, improvements and that in the next six years we will keep uh, uh, making progress. Pero la realidad es que no se está solucionando ningún problema fundamental, ninguna contradicción del sistema capitalista. But the truth is that nothing uh, fundamental is being uh, settled, no, no fundamental problem. Y como lo explicamos en el, en el manifiesto, los reformistas, eh, con su desconfianza, terminan arropándose o mostrando a la burguesía que no van a hacerles daño y que, y que bueno, están de acuerdo con... Uh, and as the, as the manifesto uh, says, uh, in their cowardice, the reformists always uh, try to prove to the ruling class that they are trustworthy managers of the system. Es justo lo que está haciendo Claudia Sheinbaum, la candidata ganadora, dando un montón de señales de que no va a ir muy lejos y de que deben de estar conformes con, bueno, que no tienen que tener miedo los... This is exactly what Cla Claudia Sheinbaum is, is doing now, sending all sorts of signals to the ruling class that she's uh, trustworthy, that she's predictable, that they should not be scared. Y claro, hay, hay fisuras, por ejemplo, los maestros han estado luchando diciendo López Obrador no echó abajo la reforma contra, contra lo, la educación que viene de los gobiernos. Uh, but there are cracks uh, opening up. For instance, the teachers have been protesting because uh, López Obrador did not do away with the Peña Nieto education counter reform. Eh, uno de los puntos que, que planteó López Obrador es esclarecer qué pasó con los 43 estudiantes que fueron desaparecidos en Ayotzinapa, bueno, en Guerrero, en el 2000. One of the, the old promises of López Obrador is that he would uh, do justice to the families of the 43 students that, were, that, that disappeared in Ayotzinapa, in the town of Ayotzinapa in 2014. Pero el proceso avanzó, la investigación avanzó hasta que tuvieron que tocar a los militares. And he did start an investigation, but that ended as soon as the question of the military came up. Y López Obrador se, está, se ha estado apoyando ya por fortalecido a las Fuerzas Armadas para llevar adelante su programa. Uh, because López Obrador has been leaning on the armed forces in order, in order to uh, push through his, uh, his program. Y en términos reales, aunque tenga una demagogia y haya esclarecido algunos detalles, 
realmente es una traición al movimiento de uh, and although he has uh, uh, and although some steps have been uh, taken this in truth this is a betrayal to those that went uh, missing in Ayotzinapa y uno de los sectores que menos votó por Claudia Sheinbaum fueron los jóvenes and uh, Claudia Sheinbaum did not uh, did not get uh, such strong support amongst the, the youth nosotros tenemos que entender el movimiento en general pero también orientarnos a las capas más avanzadas que We need to have an orientation to the general movement, but uh, especially we have to connect with the most advanced uh, layers that are drawing uh, uh, revolutionary conclusions. Por eso tenemos que ser muy críticos con los reformistas y plantear una una alternativa comunista revolucionaria para los So we have to be very critical with the reformists uh, and put forward a, a, co a revolutionary communist alternative to the youth. Por eso tenemos que construir un, un partido revolucionario, un internacional revolucionaria, de manera independiente en este momento, atrayendo a esos sectores. This is why we are launching a, a, a new revolutionary communist international that, that is independent and that can attract this uh, youth. México no es ninguna excepción, el reformismo va a fracasar, solo que tiene condiciones particulares y un ritmo diferente, pero el camino ya lo hemos visto en otros países. Mexico is not on a different planet, it just has a slightly different rhythm and the conditions are, are slightly different, but the fundamental processes are, are the same. Thank you. So comrades, um, you know that Germany now has a Veterans Day? A Veterans Day? <laughs> yeah, it will be celebrated this weekend. So now it will be fine to sing good old soldier song in public again. So at least once a year, yeah. Militarism is moving uh, to the center of politics in Germany. The ruling class is trying to create national unity uh, with patriotism, with fear of war and repression. The times of stability um, are finally over in Germany. The crisis uh, of recent years have shaken society to the core and, and polarization is growing by the day. Parliament is frag extremely fragmented and all established parties are in crisis as the EU elections show. Um, if general elections were held today, the right-wing IFD would be in, se in second place with 16% or more of the vote. The self-declared uh, progressive government of Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals uh, would be hugely punished for its policies because they are involved in the Ukraine war, they're pushing the economic crisis on the working class, and they broke all their promises within a few weeks um, after the last elections. The Conservative Party, which benefits solely from its um, opposition, or position in the opposition, yeah. And they would have to go into government with one, with one or two of these discredited parties again. So this means from now on, there will be only one crisis government after the other in Germany. In two state elections in Eastern Germany, um, this September, the IFD uh, might win over 30% of the vote. This might lead to crisis of government there without any precedent in, in the last decades. The establishment parties have no uh, so solid social base anymore because their policies don't only attack the working class, but to a um, growing extent also the middle classes. And the government has to go on the, on, on the offensive and implement austerity measures, but they know that this could easily lead to a social explosion. And this results in permanent public clashes between the governing parties. The government cannot solve any of the problems that German capitalism is facing now. At the same time, the masses are growing angry and frustrated and disillusioned with all the parties and with the capitalist system itself. But the left party uh, completely exposes uh, the weakness of left reformism. It is to totally um, subservient to uh, capital and offers no opposition. It does not organize any struggles um, and it is undergoing a fundamental process of de decay. And this is why the right wing AFD is rising. And the ruling class wants to stop this and they launched a demagogic campaign against this party. They want, they want to weaken it because of its EU position and its stance on Russia and the Ukraine war. On both, it does not correspond to the strategic aims of finance capital. And furthermore, a strong AFD would mean increased instability. The ruling class uses smear campaigns in the media. It even calls pro-democracy a uh, demonstration. Uh, they use secret, the secret service and the judiciary, and even the managers of large banks and corporations, uh, such as Daimler, Deutsche Bank, Siemens, have, vote, have made public um, declarations not to vote for the AFD, and yet the ruling class can't keep the AFD down. So this shows that only the working class on its own can uh, defeat the right wing. 
But to do so, um, the working class has uh, to wage also a fight against the liberals, against the bourgeois state and the capitalist system, um, yeah, the entire capitalist system. And the time has never been better for such a struggle. German capitalism is in, is in an existential crisis. High gas prices, high interest rates, and a decaying infrastructure as well as uh, or, yeah, are destroying uh, the industrial base in Germany. And in particular, the confrontation between the US and China is crushing German capitalism. Its complete dependence on the world market is now turning from its strength to its decisive weakness. So therefore, now a process of deindustrialization has already begun in Germany. Over the next years, tens of thousands of jobs will be destroyed, plants closed. The whole manufacturing sector is in, in, in an ever deepening crisis. And not only since the pandemic or the war, but si at least since 2018. Chemical production fell by 23% since 2022. In Last year, only as many cars were produced as in 1994. Direct investment in Germany has plummeted, and therefore the competitiveness of German capitalism is being uh, severely damaged. And that is why the ruling class is preparing enormous attacks on wages, working conditions, and on the living standards of the working class. It has to resort to austerity, wants to increase the retirement age, and also extend the working week. And in particular, there's a demagogic campaign against the youth. Many young people are disillusioned with the system. Young workers, in particular, particular are deeply disappointed with their jobs. And a large proportion have mentally um, resigned. And this is why there is a great desire uh, for a significant reduction of, the work, of working hours. And the ruling class is hypocritically attacking the youth. In particular, they call them lazy and a problem for competitiveness. So class polarization is growing enormously. Wages have fallen um, since at, at least since the war, but the, in reality they're falling for, for some time now. More and more people um, are reliant on food banks and benefits. Homelessness is rising. And as a reaction, the trade union struggles have intensified in the recent years. And, and some trade unions started to grow as a result. So young workers in particular are joining and they want to assert their interests. However, the trade union leadership cannot and does not want to lead the struggles effectively. And instead of fending off the attacks by the ruling class, they are focusing on the defense of the national economy. And then in Germany, the vacuum on the left is growing fast. Tens of thousands of young workers and youth um, are beginning to draw revolutionary conclusions. For them, communism is becoming the way out of the system. And this seed of a new revolutionary vanguard is what we base ourselves on in building the Revolutionary Communist Party in Germany. Yeah, because socialist revolution in our lifetime is a real perspective for Germany. Oh, comrades, we are, we are launching a new international, a new, a new organization, and we are breaking new ground. We are, we are pioneers in a way, and we're filling in a, a vacuum, as many comrades have said. But our organization is, is new in a way, but in another way, it's, it's very old, actually. It traces its origins back to the three great internationals and to the Communist Manifesto, as, as Alan said. And even further back to the origins of our movement, of the workers' movement. Uh, those uh, were also uh, pioneers, real pioneers. They often started off under extremely difficult uh, conditions. They were very small, minuscule minorities. But they, had, uh, they were armed with a great idea, and that allowed them to overcome all obstacles and to build mass movements and eventually storm the heavens. In Portugal, for instance, the mighty trade unions of uh, the Alentejo in the rural uh, south, they were built in 1912 by just about a dozen of uh, roving organizers who would travel around from one village to the other, chased, chased by the police. They would give speeches on the, on the village square. With very little money, they would, hand, they would uh, pass on their, their, their documents and their, their, their papers. And then the workers would read the papers, they would gather under an olive tree or, or in a cottage, uh, and the literate worker would read it out to, the, to, his, to his comrades. They organized into trade unions, and eventually they spearheaded Portugal's first general strike in, in later that year, in 1912. And I think there's a, an even more remarkable example from, from the neighboring country, from, from Spain. 
I mean, in 1868, uh, Bakunin decided to send one of his disciples to Spain to build the, to build the first international there. A very talented uh, Italian anarchist called Giuseppe Fanelli. But there was one little problem, which is that he didn't speak a word of Spanish. But still, he went to Madrid and he managed to make some contacts and he gathered uh, a handful of workers in a basement in, in Madrid. They had no translator, but still he began to speak in a mixture of French and Italian. To, Cursing capitalism, cosa horrible, spaventosa, he would say. <laughs> um, and uh, when he finished, his listeners were, were left in, in awe. They had only gotten bits and pieces from what he said, but they had understood enough. Organize the proletariat for revolution, fight the bourgeoisie, fight uh, capitalism, and that was enough. And then uh, Fanelli's followers set out across the whole of Spain to, to spread the word, and the movement spread like wildfire. And the, the Spanish section of the first international became one of the, one of the strongest on, on that basis. Now it is, uh, you could say that Fanelli was very eloquent and very charismatic, but well, that, that's not really the case. Or rather, his charisma was not a, a narrowly uh, personal trait. It rather reflected the fact that he was driven by the upsurge of the workers' movement in its uh, early, early awakening. And he was able to give it a conscious uh, expression. Fanelli and other such uh, pioneers, they, they be, as Plejanov would have said, they became a link in the chain of inevitable uh, events. And that gave them inexhaustible uh, energy, courage, uh, and, and determination. Uh, and we should learn from them and draw inspiration from these from this, uh, trailblazers. Because as I said, we are also pioneers, but we are pioneers on a much higher level because we, because we are, we are, we are, we are um, starting out on the, on the shoulders of, of giants, of the great teachers of our, of our movement. And not only that, uh, we have been strengthened by over 150 years of class struggle and, and revolution that we have learned from and that we have to, and that we have to continue studying. So we have to bear in mind that we, this is a new movement, but we are part of a very long uh, tradition of the great struggle for the liberation of the exploited and the oppressed. And our uh, task is, is to lead, lead the struggle that was begun a long time ago by our, by our political uh, forefathers and bring it uh, to a successful conclusion. Comrades, um, in most of the countries right now, uh, capitalism should, is in a boom, even if it does not feel like that uh, for the working class, nowhere. Uh, but not so in Austria. Uh, the GDP per head now is 2.5% lower than uh, the pre-COVID uh, time, than five years ago. And in the first three months, the GDP fell 1.1% uh, this year. And the midterm prognosis uh, says that there, in the coming years there will be stagnation plus a high inflation. So another five lost years for the working class. And every week now there are mass layoffs uh, and bankruptcy in industry uh, and also a collapse of public services. For example, they boot drafted soldiers into primary schools to teach and stuff like that. Yes, to learn the most important things. Obviously. So um, the main factor for this crisis uh, is the price of energy. The natural gas, which is 20% of the total energy consumption in uh, this part of Europe, is six to seven times higher than in the United States, more expensive. So it's mainly the energy-intense industry which is in crisis. For example, paper industry dropped uh, 9% last year. The general problem is that uh, with these high prices, the indus industry is not competitive anymore on the world, world markets. And there are other problems. With the protectionism of the United States, there's a flight of capital into the United States, a decapitalization. The Green Deal of the European Union, which wants to phase out uh, combustion engines in, 2030, in the year 2035, puts at risk another 240,000 jobs in this sector. And in general, the European Union is a too, has a too small, uh, the single market is uh, too small and uh, for, to concentrate enough capital to do the jump on new technology and to push up uh, new industries like artificial intelligence or the military complex they want to push ahead. So, to cut a long story short, in the epoch of confrontation of the big imperialist uh, players, 
United States on one hand and Russia and China on the other hand. For small imperialist uh, robberies, robbers, they are really a lot, uh, under a lot of pressure. They are truly squeezed. In a sense, this is true for uh, the whole uh, Europe, the whole European Union, but for the small statelets, uh, they are really coming into an existential crisis because of this. Because if you look at this country, it, it was founded in 1918 as the rest of the empire, shaped by Versailles uh, Treaty. And 20 years later, the bourgeoisie was so weak to give it as a present to Hitler. But then the Allies, including the Stalinists, decided it's good to them uh, that this country re-emerges uh, as an independent capitalist uh, country on military neutral, as to serve as a bridge in the Cold War situation. And we were supposed to have good relations to everyone, to the benefits uh, for everyone, economic, diplomatic, political, but also have many uh, very liberal laws on espionage and so on, so they can exchange information in Vienna, it's a very beautiful city. So this was the basis of economic growth and political stability for decades. Yes. Uh, but this, is, uh, this epoch is finished and it will never come back. The world is completely different now. And the point uh, of, uh, the point of, uh, inf uh, once more, uh, and the, uh, it's it, because of the Ukraine war is uh, spiraling the whole thing. I give two examples. Uh, the biggest bank of the country is uh, the biggest foreign bank in Russia, the Raiffeisen Bank International. But they have a problem with the sanctions. They cannot transfer the profits anymore. And when they wanted to divest uh, a bit, the United States said, no, you cannot. Instead, they say, you must go out of Russia completely. If not, we may sanction you. We will put you out of the US market, which is the, the end of the bank, obviously. But also, as Alan pointed out, uh, Putin is not so stupid. Uh, the, he says, uh, well, if you want to divest from Russia, we well might expropriate you fully without compensation. <laughs> <laughs> so th I think this is called in English to live between a rock and a hard place. Uh, in reality, it's a real death match for the leading imperialist, uh, for, for the leading finance uh, capital institute of the country. Uh, and the second thing is 90% of the gas still comes from Russia. During last winter, even 98%. But there's no, I have no time to go into the details, but the most likely, because it can happen from many angles, the most likely thing is that this gas will stop to flow because of pressure of Western imperialism in this year. So another very stupid situation. Uh, so there is a, a, a crisis of historic uh, dimensions uh, being uh, prepared. And the only way out would be a relaxation of the inter-imperialist contradictions between the United States and Russia and China on the other hand. And we know this is out, uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, possible. It's the other way around. Imperialist confrontation is escalating in the economic field, in the political field, but even in the military field. There's a, uh, there's, there's a unity now, uh, despite this confrontation in the United States, there's a unity uh, was established between the Republican and the Democrats to give more money to the uh, Ukraine puppet government and to give more money to Israel. Uh, and I think the basic tendency of this epoch is, as long as the working class accepts its bourgeois, uh, accepts this warmongering of its bourgeoisies, they, they, they must go ahead, uh, as it was uh, brilliantly explained by Jordi beforehand. And then there is, and then there is the Gaza, Gaza war, uh, uh, which is the main point of political crisis in Austria and in many other countries, I think. Because facing this unsoluble crisis with the uh, Ukraine war, the Austrian bourgeois had a very crafty idea. They said, well, uh, we try, uh, we, we, we be the cheerleader of uh, Israel. So perhaps then the United States forgets about our good business we have with Russia. A brilliant idea up to the point uh, when now there's an open split between the Netanyahu government and the Biden administration. Now they are completely confused. <laughs> every week, uh, every week in the paper, they have a new definition of anti-Semitism uh, <laughs> fitting into the real situation. <laughs> so, but uh, the general thing is that there, the, uh, in this country, 
uh, believe it or not, there is a constant political campaign against two main issues. First, against the Russian spies, because everywhere there are Russian spies, which is true, <laughs> but they never cared about it. Um, and the second campaign is against anti-Semitism. So, and every political party, every political space backs down this opinion uh, matrix, uh, backs down politically to Western imperialism. Especially the liberals and the social democrats in a very devout and even aggressive way. But also the soft communists of the Communist Party of Austria and its youth, or one of its many youth organizations, because they also have Zionist youth organizations. Uh, but also the communist, Stalin, uh, the orthodox Stalinist communist youth, they, they back down this pressure. Okay. Oh, we must speed up. Um, so. Uh, the, the, cat, the leading category of Russian agents is the FPÖ, which uh, the Nationalist Party, which won the European elections, uh, number one party now. They don't want uh, to break uh, with Russia, and therefore there is a constant campaign against them, the uh, same as the AfD in Germany. I just quote from Politico, the US magazine, it says, the title uh, reads, Putin hijacked Austria's spy service, now he's going after its government. Um, yeah. Secret Service. And it says, with uh, Kickel, the leader of the Nationalist Party, with the Kickel as Prime Minister, it's a safe bet that Vienna would, pressure, uh, would pursue even closer economic ties with Moscow. And with both Slovakia and Hungary already leaning towards Russia, Austria's entry into the Kremlin's sphere of influence would create a Putin-friendly bloc stretching from the Carpathians to the Eastern Alps, posing a fundamental challenge. Okay, but posing a fundamental challenge to European security. I must skip something. Uh, in any case, um, the second category is the anti-Semites, and these are two kinds of people. This is uh, the, the Muslims, uh, the migrants, and secondly, the Revolutionary Communist International, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Yes, we, uh, I, I'm sure we have time to talk about it later on. I just, on one observation uh, to the Mani Communist Manifesto, it's a brilliant document, and studying uh, uh, its uh, method uh, clearly indicates that there is not really a vacuum on the left. Because uh, in our founding uh, manifesto, we, we engage in a political debate with the living forces of communism outside uh, of the RCI. And I think this is very uh, important. Uh, I mean, we are, we are so proud on our party, but we cannot oversee there, there, there are also other uh, political tendencies in the working class, much stronger ones than we are at the moment. First of all, there are still big reformist uh, parties, which is true, they're politically rotten to the core with a huge apparatus uh, funded by the state and under full uh, pressure of the bourgeoisie, but they still exist and exercise an influence on the working class. Two minutes. Two minutes. There are also the union uh, leaderships that use all the power to maintain a peaceful relation uh, of themselves with the employers, so co class collaboration, social partnership, I call it. And then it comes nearer to us. There are the soft communists, the traditional Stalinist party that gave up on themselves. They pursue. Nowadays, a policy like social democracy 30 years ago. Um, so the policy of a stable uh, capitalist development, this is, this is basically their program. Then we have the sects of all sorts, and then we have petty bourgeois ideas. Correct, yes. Uh, petty bourgeois idea like identity politics, uh, boycott, uh, BDS, uh, and all this stuff. Ideas that are catching the ima imagination of the young avant-garde that is aspiring to fight capitalism. So I think it's correct to say that uh, the left uh, is in a huge crisis. They crawl before the liberals, all these uh, name tendencies. They are fully detached of the burning desire of the young new avant-garde of our class who wants to fight capitalism. And this is why it's the absolute correct thing to go for the founding congress of the Revolutionary Commons International to appeal uh, to this new emerging avant-garde of this uh, class struggle to join us in order to be strong, to, 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 uh, to build the hard communist 
organization of the international uh, la labor movement, which is what we need to win, and we will win. Good afternoon, comrades. Serge Goulart from Brazil. And I have some uh, some uh, observations about the the event that we're holding today. This is a bold step. Uh, we're taking a step that Trotsky never had the, 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 the chance of taking. Because he was completely encircled by the international apparatus of the Stalinists and social democracy that controlled the, 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 the international workers' movement. He says in a determined moment that his task was to write the program Trotsky said that his task was to keep, uh, uh, to keep maintain the thread of continuity in, in Marxism. And that it was up to the, uh, to the coming generations to uh, free the world from all uh, oppression. Uh, he, he, uh, did, he, his main legacy is the, the, the transitional program, which uh, brings together the, the main lessons of the first uh, congresses of the, of the Communist International and of Marxism. Uh, faced with the, the, the degeneration of the apparatuses and the organizations that claim to stand for the working class. Uh, but the comrades have already spoken about this degeneration uh, in their interventions. I thought the interventions were all excellent. This is a very important point in our history and it might be a turning point for the, for the world workers' movement. For us, uh, it, we, we rule out uh, that we can build a, a communist uh, international uh, um, without the Marxist program. Without uh, the Bolshevik tradition and without the tradition of workers' democracy. We trust uh, the working class not because because of uh, faith, but because of our understanding of, uh, of of because of our historical materialist understanding. That uh, the history of humanity is the history of, of the class struggle. Uh, and uh, our enthusiasm and our faith in the future of humanity and in the work and our trust in the working class flows from this understanding. We are taking a very important step today for us and for the workers' movement. Does, that does not mean that a communist international that is worthy of that name that is an international that can lead the masses to a revolution across the world um, may have the, the shape uh, and the composition that we have uh, now uh, at this present moment uh, yes, in the future we will not have this shape or composition Pero sin esta organización, combatiendo para construir y ganar cada joven que va a transformarse en trabajador y ganar más jóvenes y organizar a la clase obrera, no hay futuro y no habrá nunca una internacional comunista revolucionaria digna de conducir las más. Necesitamos de los que estamos acá, 
But without uh, this organization, without us going out and winning over those uh, youths that will become the working class uh, uh, vanguard in the future, such an international will be uh, impossible. It depends on us, on those that are here today. Hay muchas internacionales proclamadas. La cuarta internacional acaba de discutir un documento donde propone que la gente no coma más carne y haga su propia ropa. Uh, there are many uh, self-proclaimed internationals. The, the so-called fourth international has just issued a document where they uh, proposed that uh, people stop eating meat and that they make their own uh, clothes. <laughs> Todas las otras listas de donarias sangrientas que hay por ahí all the other so-called internationals and groups and, and international organizations are all desperate, are all scrambling uh, to get someone elected to public office. And following that uh, path, they are just uh, uh, propping up uh, capitalism and, 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 and in, in its current form, which is imperialist. The international has been able to have uh, its uh, finger on the pul pulse of the, of, the, of the youth, of the working class, and, and that's why we are growing. Hemos percibido que el desaparecimiento político real, no material, real políticamente, de los aparatos contrarrevolucionarios que controlaban la clase, ha abierto una situación nueva. Uh, and we have, uh, we, we acknowledge that the, 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 the disappearance, the, the political rather than the material disappearance of the apparatuses that were holding back the working class has opened up a new uh, situation. No es que el camino está llano y ahora vamos triunfantes hasta la victoria. No es esto. That doesn't mean that the road is clear and that we just have to march onwards uh, to victory. Hay muchos obstáculos organizados por la burguesía dentro de la clase obrera y de la juventud. We'll come up with many obstacles that are organized by the bourgeoisie uh, in the working class and amongst the, the youth. Un enorme obstáculo a nuestra son las teorías burguesas y burguesas de acciones afirmativas, identitarismos, etc. Uh, a, a very big challenge for us are the, the petty bourgeois and bourgeois ideas that have spread amongst uh, the youth about uh, identity politics and positive discrimination and such things. Yes, we cannot simply skirt around this uh, issue, we have to uh, face it head on. Cuando un gobierno burgués empieza una guerra, en general la clase obrera se compila Junto con su when the ruling class starts uh, a war, generally the, the first, um, the first uh, instinct of the working class is to rally around the government. Look at Russia. But this uh, nas national unity can break down, especially if there is a, the, the conscious intervention of the Marxists. Y para eso, para él, Para hacer esto tenemos que tener una organización internacional y organizaciones nacionales fuertes, independientes, organizadas y decididas al combate hasta el final. Uh, and for, in order to do this, we need to have a strong international, strong national sections that are, that are, that are committed and, and conscious and determined to take the struggle un, until its uh, 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 final consequences. Y tenemos un problema nuevo a resolver. And we have another problem that we have to uh, solve. We've won over lots of uh, young communists. We need to uh, keep them with us. And to educate them uh, from communists to, to Marxists. As Bolsheviks. And we're, we're, we're getting our, our hands on this. We're trying to, to, to get around this, this, uh, this task. In the Bible, in, in St. John's, uh, um, what is it, the Gospel, yes, in the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word. Wolfgang Goethe, the great genius Alemán, dice. Many centuries later, after a lot of development, 
Goethe, the great uh, German genius, said, In the beginning was not the word, it was, it was the deed. And that gave grounds to, the, to Rosa Luxemburg's idea. Uh, yes, that, that, that takes me to Rosa Luxemburg's criticism of the Kautskists uh, when she said that they think that the working class can just um, develop into socialism by reading books and having uh, study circles. But in a similar way, uh, as uh, how Marx and Engels combine materialism with uh, dialectics, we have here a similar uh, combination between uh, practice. Es la entre la y la yes, between practice and theory. O sea, actuar en la lucha de clases fundamental, pero junto con la teoría, porque sin teoría no hay movimiento revolucionario. To intervene in the class uh, struggle, but to do so armed with the weapon of uh, theory, because without theory there is no revolutionary movement. En la, pues, en la discusión sobre socialismo, barbarie, en qué perspectiva tenemos, Rosa Luxemburgo eh, atribuye a Engels una frase que no es exactamente la frase de Engels. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, used to uh, cl uh, used a, a, um, a phrase that she claims to have taken from Engels, but this is not uh, entirely accurate. I do like like the youth. I look for so, for something to read. I want to read out something from my phone, but I can't find it. <laughs> the clock is ticking. <clears throat> <laughs> Yet another mistake from a Trotskyist. <laughs> but this is a this is a sentence from this is a phrase from Engels, a quote from Engels. Engels says that this society needs to develop further, but it is uh, fettered by the by the econ by the economy. <clears throat> he says uh, literally that uh, we need socialism, or this society will will disappear, will will collapse. The truth is that history is 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 wide open uh, in front of us. <clears throat> Depende de nosotros. This means that uh, it, it all comes down to us. Y saben ustedes que como dice Napoleón, dijo Napoleón Bonaparte, 50% de la batalla es la moral de la tropa. And uh, as, you, as you know, Napoleón said that 50% uh, of the battle is decided by the level of, of morale of the troop. En la situación que vivimos, Ucrania, más de 600 muertos en Raniano, el genocidio en Gaza. We, we, the situation we live in is the, the butchery in, in, in Ucraine with 700,000 dead and, and the genocide in Gaza. En Brasil, Lula quita el embajador de, de, de Israel, pero hace un contrato de un mil millones de, de reales para comprar armas y tanques de guerra de Israel ahora, o sea, con una mano yes. maquilla otra. In Brazil, the Lula has expelled the Israeli ambassador, but at the same time, just a few days ago, he signed a deal to buy uh, one billion reais worth of weapons from, from Israel. Y termino eh, rápidamente el trabajo que hemos hecho en Brasil sin dejar de fijar nuestra condición con otros agrupamientos militantes de otras de PCB del partido And very quickly I'll, I'll end up I'll end up by talking about the type of activities we've had with other groups like the PCB the, the Brazilian Communist Party in addition to our own internal work. Empezamos en 2014 una ofensiva sobre el Partido Comunista Brasileño sobre la contrarrevolución de la Plaza Maidan en Ucrania. Uh, Sacamos una declaración común internacional in 2014, we began to put pressure on the Brazilian Communist uh, Party, starting off with the question of the counter-revolution in Maidan, and we, we issued a, a joint statement over the events in Ukraine. 
El año pasado, en un gran acto con 200 y pico de personas, eh, la OSA y Organización Comunista Analista, nosotros, la Asociación Brasileña, y el PCB RR, sobre la cuestión palestina y un auditorio discutiendo durante tres horas. En last November, we held a, a big rally with uh, 200 people. Uh, of the Brazilian section and the, the PCB RR, so the, the people that have uh, been expelled, on the Palestinian question. Nuestros camaradas estudiantes están par han participado de todas las actividades de Palestina, incluso de la ocupación de acampamientos en universidades brasileñas, la U. Our young comrades have uh, have been involved in all of the solidarity initiatives with Sp with Palestine, including the the encampments in in Sao Paulo. Bueno, han visto el saludo que Iván Piñero, que es el histórico importante, secretario general del PCB durante muchos años, es una figura del movimiento obrero brasileño, ha enviado a esta conferencia. And you've uh, heard the, the the greetings that were sent by Iván Piñero, who is the historical general secretary of the Brazilian uh, Communist Party. Ben Curry, in the name of the Secretary of the National and Caio of the Session Brazilian, have participated in all the Congress of the PCB-RR, which is now, this day, the only organization invited. And Caio from the Brazilian section and Ben Curry from the, from the, from the International participated in the, in the founding uh, Congress of the PCB-RR. They were, they were the only we were the only organization that had been invited to the Congress. Except for the leftovers of some insignificant communist parties that have no role to play. But uh, the, the KUKUE, which is the main, uh, the main organization in this whole uh, global tendency, was not present. They just sent their, their, their greetings. And uh, the, those Stalinist leftovers in the Congress, they were against uh, the Trotskyists. But e even so, we intervened. We were there thanks to Ivan Piñeiro. We don't know where this party is, is heading to. Pero tenemos un acuerdo muy fuerte con Iván Piñeiro. But we are in a, we have a very strong agreement with Iván Piñeiro. De que la situación mundial de hoy exige un nuevo Zimmerwald. That the global the, the, the world situation today demands a new Zimmerwald. Para llegar a una verdadera internacional comunista de ley. In order to uh, uh, rebuild a, a genuine uh, uh, communist international like that of Lenin. Lo que me dicen los Camaradas de Grecia eh, tienen que decir cómo está esto impactando ahí, porque es donde interesa más. The Greek comrades should speak about how this is having an impact there, which is where they're, they're most relevant. No puedo terminar sin decir que durante el año pasado una organización que tenía el nombre de Revolución Brasileña, que se había hundido a un tiempo, se construyó como la parte que exigió centralidad del trabajo. Hemos discutido con los camaradas se fraccionó esta organización y hemos integrado un tercio de esta organización de los mejores cuadros, incluso un de ellos, camarada Mauricio, que está acá presente como delegado hoy de la OCE. And in addition to that, another split away uh, far left group uh, known as Brazilian Revolution, they had an internal debate, we were in a discussion with them. And we won over the, the, a big chunk of the organization, their best and most active uh, cadres. And one of the comrades we have here from the Brazilian delegation, Comrade Mauricio, comes from that, uh, from that group. Gracias. Thank you. Compañeros, creo expresar el sentimiento de todos los compañeros italianos. Comrades, I think I speak for every Italian comrade here. En decir que es un grandísimo honor por nosotros hospitar este fantástico acto de fundación de la Internacional Comunista Revolución. In saying it's an honor to host this amazing event, which is the foundation of the Revolutionary Communist International. Habrá, habrá mucho trabajo organizativo. There's pero lots estamos, of organizational work. Pero estamos motivados, confiados, 
But we're motivated, we're confident, and we're enthusiastic of what we are building for the working class and the youth. The other day, a comrade from Colombia asked me if in Italy we have fascism knocking at our door. I'd like to answer that question. Usually we don't talk much about European elections. Pero esa elección esta europea que se han hecho este fin de semana tienen algo en común. But the elections for European Parliament that just passed this weekend have a, a, pecu a peculiarity. Ya el camarada Jerome lo planteó, dimisiones de Macron. Jerome's already spoken about it, um, about Macron. Una posible victoria electoral en julio de Rassemblement Nacional, la derecha, la extrema derecha francesa. A possible win for the far right in France. Luego tenemos Meloni en Italia. Then we have Meloni in Italy. Una avanzada de AFD en Alemania. Uh, we have the rise of AFD in Germany. Vox llega. Vox. El blanc bloc, que ya no me acuerdo cómo se llama ahora, de Belgium. This party in Belgium, I can't remember its name FPO anymore. FPO in Austria. FPO in Austria. Hoy, la marea negra. The black tide. Vamos a aclarar un poco eso. Let's clear things up. Eso es lo que dicen los This is what the reformists say. Meloni, el gobierno más reaccionario derechista de la República. In Italy, reformists say, oh, Meloni is the most reactionary right-wing government of the Republic. Los reformistas gritan. The reformists shout. Lloran. They cry. Nosotros somos entusiastas. But we are optimistic. Because we have the dialectical method. And we can apply it to history. And I want to say a little bit about Italian history. That's our country where fascism was born. And it triumphed a century ago. And we must understand this was the result of a betrayed revolution. Between 1919 and 1920, the Italian workers were taking the example of Russia and they were taking power. They occupied the factories and it was the reformist leadership that betrayed them of the Socialist Party. In 1942, Mussolini Hizo una asamblea en, en la fábrica más importante en Italia, Mirafiori en Turín. En 1942, Mussolini had a, una asamblea. Had an assembly, a, uh, com a commission, in one of the most important factories in Turín. Y había trabajadores aterrorizados que aplaudían al dictador. And there were really scared workers that were clapping for this dictator. El año siguiente, esa misma clase obrera, en el marzo del 43, tumbó la dictadura. The next year, this same working class, in March of 1943, overthrew this dictator. Y empezó un proceso revolucionario. And they began a revolutionary process. En ese caso, fue descarrillado por los estalinistas. And in this case, it was derailed by Stalinism. Hasta hubo un episodio. We even had an... an an episode in Naples, donde un pueblo con manos nuda echó al ejército nazi fascista a la ciudad de Naples. In Naples, where workers with their bare hands kicked out the fascist troops. Y en 1960 llegó un gobierno de centro derecha. And then in 1960, there was a right center government que permitió a un fascista hacer al al movimiento fascista hacer un congreso en la ciudad de, de Genova that allowed the fascists to have a congress in the city of Genova hubo una movilización masiva de la juventud proletaria los chicos con las camisas rayadas there was a, este congreso, there's a mass proletarian youth movement, the ones with the striped shirts, and they kicked out the fascists. Entre los años 60 y los años 80, hemos tenido por lo menos cinco sentencias 
the golpe de estado in Italia. Between the 60s and the 80s, we had at least five coup attempts in Italy. Como decía Alan correctamente, like Alan rightly said, la conciencia es algo muy flexible. Consciousness is quite flexible. Y no hay revolución sin contra revolución. And there is no revolution without counter-revolution. De de These are sin symptoms of what's next for the next mobilization of the working Porque class. Because this same country that had 20 years of a fascist dictatorship and reactionary mobilizations of all sorts also had a very militant working class. We've had a May 68 that's gone on for 10 years. Between 1968 and 1977, Italy had the biggest communist party in Western Europe. The youth and the working class were aspiring for communism. The Communist Party of Italy had about two million members. And what's what's left of this party? It's it's now ashes. Due to the um, leadership. Well, um, Jerome has said Alex from Germany and Emma. That the rise uh, on the electoral front of these reactionary parties, Bonapartists. Reformism is to blame. Stalinism is to blame. And we need to re-tie the knot to go back to authentic communist traditions that have been betrayed. Going back to the Colombian comrades question. Primero, Meloni es nieta de los fascistas. First of all, Meloni is the granddaughter of fascists. Pero el fascismo, como es planteada Trotsky, but fascism, as Trotsky explained, es un movimiento de masa armado de la pequeña burguesía del lumpen proletariato contra la clase. It's a mass armed movement of the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen proletariat against the working class. Esto ya no existe hoy. There's no such thing anymore. The, the balance is different now. And we are many, many defeats away from something like that. And the working class in Italy and Europe hasn't had massive defeats, really. Meloni is not mobilizing the petty bourgeois or the lumpen proletariat against the proletariat. If we would like to characterize this party, we could say it's a bourgeois Bonapartist party in the sense that that it bases itself on, on the force, the historic tradition that this has with um, being linked with fascism. But in fact, Meloni's government no es un gobierno bonapartista. It's not a Bonapartist Para government. Nada. Not at all. Hasta Financial Times lo aclaró. Even Financial Times has cleared this up for us. Le dieron un apoyo total. They gave her uncritical support. Y la burguesía lo está acompañando en Italia. And the bourgeois is backing her up. Porque está llevando adelante el programa de austeridad de la burguesía italiana europea y mundial. Because she's carrying out the austerity program of the Italian bourgeoisie and the world bourgeoisie in, politica interna, in, politica exterior. in um, internal politics and in foreign politics as well. And let's see about this uh, prospect of a Le Pen government si no va a pasar lo mismo. if she's not going to carry Entonces, out the same thing. Al gobierno, se These Bonapartists, when they get to power, they'll adapt. Al mismo tiempo, at the, same, at the same time, they provoke. 
el proletariado, los jóvenes, las mujeres. They provoke the proletariat, the youth, women. Las personas LGTB. The LGBT community. Y esto al final va a provocar una reacción. And this is going to create a reaction. Un nuevo otoño caliente. A new red October. Un nuevo mayo 68. A new May 68. Tenemos que estar preparado a esta perspectiva. We must be prepared for that perspective. Y no estamos listos. And we're not ready yet. Porque hemos avanzado mucho. Because we've made great strides. Y tenemos que avanzar mucho más. And there's still a long way to go. Y habrá dificultades, no hay duda. There, there will be hardship, for sure. Obstáculos. There'll be obstacles. Pero compañero, yo que he visto cuando era muy joven. But comrades, I've seen things from when I was really young. ¿Qué era el Partido Comunista en Italia? What was the Communist Party in Italy? Todavía en los años 80. Even in the 80s. No estoy hablando de los 70 o de los 60, en el 80. Not the 70s or the 60s, I'm talking about the 80s. Había un dicho que era, no se mueve hoja que el PC no quiera. There was a saying that when not a, not a leaf falls without the Communist Party taking it. Yo que he visto este mastodóntico aparato burocrático. I've seen this massive bureaucratic apparatus. Que casi no le permitía respirar a la clase obrera. That almost suffocated the working class. He visto dirigente como Enrico Berlinguer. I've seen leaders like Enrico Berlinguer. Sí, Enrico Berlinguer. Y la enorme autoridad que tenía sobre una capa muy grande de la clase obrera. And the massive authority he had over a big layer of society. Ahora veo los dirigentes reformistas de izquierda. Now I see these left reformist leaders. Y con todo el respeto. And respectfully. Me da mucha risa. I have to laugh. Y la clase obrera no mira a ellos. And the working class is not looking towards them. La verdad es que Meloni está en el gobierno. And Meloni is in power. Tenía un movimiento muy pequeño. And she had a small movement Porque behind her. Porque fue el único partido a la oposición del gobierno Draghi, un gobierno burgués. Because she was the only opposition for the Draghi gov government, for a bourgeois government. Esto tenemos que entender cuando vemos una avanzada de la... De la... We must understand this when we see a, that, that, that the right is on the move. Pero la realidad But in reality, es que la Meloni tiene miedo a la clase obrera y a la clase obrera y a la Is that Meloni is scared of the working class and the youth in Italy? Cuando hubo la ocupación de la universidad, bueno, la, la acampada de la universidad. When we had the encampments at the universities. No movilizaron la policía. They didn't mobilize the police. Tienen miedo, que saben They're scared because they know que en cualquier momento that it, at any moment esta grande tradición Comunista, this long communist tradition volverá. will come back. Y nosotros estaremos allí. And we will be there. Estamos preparando el partido, compañeros, también en Italia. We're also preparing the party in Italy. Estamos lanzando una grande asamblea en Roma. We're launching a big. We're launching a big meeting in Rome on the 23rd of November. Donde públicamente. Where publicly. Ofreceremos, ofreceremos we will offer a toda esta capa de jóvenes que busca una alternativa radical towards this layer of youth who are looking for a radical alternative un partido a party donde pueden luchar where they can fight combatir de, y al mismo tiempo educarse políticamente and at the same time get educated politically porque esto es nuestro cimiento la, la teoría marxista Because that is our foundation, Marxist theory. Que cada uno de nosotros se tiene que apropiar. And each of us have to take ownership of that. Y tenemos que apasionar los jóvenes que ganamos a la organización, a la teoría. And we make everyone that we win into our organization passionate about theory. Eso es el objetivo de esta... That's also the aim of this Congress. Acabando, compañero, quiero lanzarle una invitación. So, comrades, I'm inviting you now. You're all invited to Rome for the 23rd of November. <laughs> Ryanair flights are cheap. I'm expecting at least the European ones. A hundred comrades, and we'll see it's worth it. It'll be a great Congress. Well, Following on from what Alessandro said, 
In 1976, I was one of those two million Italian communists, and they sent me to a party cadre school to educate me in the ideas of the Italian Communist Party, which I did not need. I had been educated by our organization. But I remember I would, you couldn't openly criticize, you could only pose your questions as in a kind of question form because it was such a Stalinist party. And this must have been the most difficult moment to criticize the leadership of the Communist Party. It was one month after the biggest electoral victory of the Communist Party. And I got taken to one side by one of the party officials and said, how can you criticize Berlinguer when he has led us to such a great victory? Well, you see now how many years have gone by, I've lost count. That, as Alessandro pointed out, that party has been completely destroyed by history. I hope I get an invitation to the conference in Rome later this year. It will be a pleasure. But comrades, as we gather here to found the Revolutionary Communist International, we, we are at the beginning of an unprecedented crisis of this system that we live in. And it is going to be on a scale that humanity has never seen before. Now, the propaganda of the bourgeois tries to counter that. And people hope and pray that things will get better somehow. But it is becoming clearer as each day passes that things are getting worse. And we are only at the beginning of this process. But just, just simply looking at all the facts and figures about the global debt crisis, when you have a, wor a world debt, which is 350% of world GDP, that encapsulates how serious this crisis is. And it's increasing. Such a level of debt is unsustainable. But everywhere, the national debts are growing. And the only answer the capitalists have to this is more and more austerity. That is, make the workers pay through longer hours, raising the age of retirement, destroying health care, education. The young generation have no future. The level of rent in most major cities in the Western world is absurd. And, and getting a mortgage is practically impossible. There is a constant pressure on the working class everywhere. So we have to try and imagine how this is going to pan out. Now, recently we had the events in Argentina that Jordi, or Jorge Martin, sorry, wrote about. With inflation at the levels we see in Argentina, which is the future of many countries, life becomes absolutely intolerable. And we see something we haven't seen very often, a crack in the security forces themselves. Some police officers siding with the teachers. Now, not all the police in Argentina are like that, obviously. <laughs> but the state had to consider using other police forces against one section of the police. Now, how many times have we had theoretical discussions about this kind of possibility? And yet here we have a living example of that. That is something we, we will also see in other countries. Now, the point is this, the capitalist system has lived far beyond its role in history, and it is destroying what it had achieved in the past. The austerity is destroying the concessions they gave to the working class, and that is rendering all countries unstable. But in attempting to solve their crises, the national bourgeoisies are fighting each other. And the Ukraine war is an example of that, an inter-imperialist war with each imperialist class defending its interests. And it's a global conflict, it's not just the Ukraine. It's US imperialism mainly against Russia and China. China is feeling the effects of this situation. It's still growing, but the pace of growth has slowed. It's not enough to guarantee stability inside China. China needs to export more in the context of the world where protectionism is on the rise. And this is a creating tensions inside China. The phenomenon of unpaid wages is back. Strikes are coming back. What this means is a future of class struggle in China. And the way the, the, uh, the ruling class in China tries to avoid that is by unloading the crisis on other countries. In the war with the Ukraine, America is squeezing Europe. The German comrades spoke about the effects in Germany. This powerhouse of, of Europe now facing growing internal problems, instability, polarization, and growing class struggle. And Gaza is part of this worldwide conflict. 
But there's another place, Taiwan. It's a potential Ukraine times 10. If the conflict in Taiwan ever reached the situation like in the Ukraine, which would be an open conflict between the US and China, it would have a devastating impact on the world economy. It would create worldwide revolutionary conditions. But we already have wars and civil wars around the world. More than 30 countries have wars or civil wars. From places like Libya to Syria, Burma, Congo, Sudan, and many others. In the Sudan, there are 8 million displaced peoples. 5 million people are one step away from famine. It could happen this month. 18 million are food insecure just in that country alone. The Congo is in an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. It is classified as the largest hunger emergency in the world. 25 million people are struggling every day just to get enough food to survive. And it also has over 5 million displaced people. Women in the Congo are facing absolute hell. One statistic shows that one in seven women experience sexual violence before the age of 18. That is what you call women's oppression. In Haiti, we have another example, basically the collapse of the bourgeois state and areas of the country under the control of criminal gangs. Globally, we have 108 million displaced people. Imagine that is greater than the population of Germany. Imagine that, everybody in Germany displaced. It's the highest number ever recorded. Because of this hell, in 2022, over a quarter of a million people attempted to cross the Mediterranean. Since 2014, that is in the last 10 years, 20,000 have died trying to cross the Mediterranean. I have a friend who is an ex-army officer in Italy. They have, he told me how they have special teams of divers whose job is to find the corpses at the bottom of the sea. This is a consequence of the crisis of the system. It is a sea of humanity trying to escape intolerable conditions. And then on, on top of this, we have the climate change. Flooding, killing, uh, affecting millions of people. Drought affecting agriculture. Millions of peasants forced to abandon their land. Fleeing into the cities to live in slum conditions. It is truly a living hell that this system has created for the world population. But think about it. Climate change. How can that be tackled? If not through an international, world, rational plan of the economy. There is no way it can be solved under capitalism. It's a very powerful argument in favor of the need for a world socialist federation of all countries. The, but on top of this, the 800 million people worldwide are classified as being um, uh, food insecure. Close to 60 countries require some kind of food assistance. And yet, statistics show the world actually produces enough food for 12 billion people. There is no reason why people should starve. The cause is capitalism. They boast that the markets work. Capitalism works. Well, just look around the world and you'll find the answer to that. Now, the point is this. All of this is, is seeping into the consciousness of millions of people. They no longer believe the propaganda. I try to explain to some of, some of our older comrades, older than me, that is, that young people do not get their news from the BBC. And they certainly don't get it from the Telegraph or the Daily Express. People get their news from other channels these days. They look for the truth. They, they question the system, so they question the news. So this explains why, in spite of everything that they say about Lenin, the number of times you meet a young person that says they've read Lenin, they've read State and Revolution, and they say, wow, that explains what's going on. Or, or they've read the Communist Manifesto. That's the good thing about the internet. You can find these texts far easier than when I was a kid. When I was a teenager, you literally had to go and find some left bookshop to get these books. So the ideas of Marxism are much more um, out there than we actually can imagine. And it's because of this widespread radicalization that you can explain, for example, how quickly the interviews with Fiona, our comrade in Britain, spread to millions. Jordi, one day, he sent me a a tweet, uh, some Twitter account, which had been, which with, with a video, which had been seen two and a half million times. 
by the time I actually looked at Geordie's WhatsApp message and I clicked on it, it had gone up to 2.8 million. 300,000 people in a few hours. The Arabic, an Arabic account, initially 300,000. When I looked at it, it was 600,000. It's, it's, it's definitely millions by now. How can such a thing happen? Well, it's, it's rooted in the analysis that we're making of society today. And it means we have to raise the profile of the organization high. We have to make it as easy as possible for those youth to find us. You see, we have the program. The program is very basic. Ten, ten, the 10 richest people in the world have $1.5 trillion in wealth. The, the concentration of wealth in the hands of the few is enormous. So our program is not tax the rich, because, because tax the rich means they stay rich. Our program, program is expropriate the rich. We have the analysis, we have the perspectives, we have the philosophical outlook which allows us to develop these ideas. We have an understanding of history, and because of that, we also understand where society is going. We can see what is coming. That means we prepare, and we understand that we can actually build something which can affect historical development. And that, comrades, is this organization. It's up to you, and I'll do my bit to build it. First and forward, foremost, thank you, comrade, for allowing me to speak on the founding session of the RCI. I would like to come in on the perspectives for Taiwan, which, as most of you know, is in the news a lot lately. Many look at Taiwan as a potential flashpoint in the inter-imperialist rivalry between the US and China, which lots of comrades have already touched on. So I'd like to come in on the internal perspective of Taiwan as a country, because despite its peculiarities, Taiwan is undergoing the very same crisis of capitalism with the same general expressions of it in the society. And like everywhere in the world, the forces of revolutionary communism can be built there. The bourgeois democracy in Taiwan today was consolidated in the late 1990s. The workers and masses forced the old KMT dictatorship into giving up on autocracy. But the incompleteness of that struggle gave us a peculiar democracy with no workers' parties. And the national questions always sidelining the class question. For a time, this system maintained a certain equilibrium. Now, this system is perhaps going into the most turbulent crisis it has ever seen. The newly elected president, William Lai, managed to secure only 40% of the vote. He is from the Democratic Progressive Party, the pro-U.S. party that already governed Taiwan in the past eight years. Despite his claim to be the only chance to defend Taiwan's democracy from Chinese imperialism, and the DPP has also lost its dominance in the legislative branch of the government to the more poor China, KMT, and TPP. They lost votes precisely because they have been carrying out policies that squeeze the, workers, the working class and the workers' rights, making the workers and youth work very long hours with pitiful pay. Despite the fact that Taiwan has a highly advanced economy with GDP per capita larger than Japan and South Korea. Internationally, part of the intensifying conflicts between China and the US surrounds on the Taiwan issue. On one hand, the Chinese government has been attempting to banish the American influence in East Asia in order to expand its sphere of influence into the Pacific. On the other hand, the US is cynically using Taiwan to put pressure on China and keep it in check. The potential for thus weighs heavily on people's minds. 
and the ruling class of both sides on this conflict cynically played up war hysteria amongst the workers for their own ends. The new president and his party, DPP, which has traditionally been pro-U.S., will only continue strengthening their ties with American capitalism and imperialism. Neither, however, as the Taiwanese people began to realize, neither closer ties to the U.S. or China can solve the question of worsening social crisis around cost of living, low pay, housing, and collapsing welfare programs. For example, 12% of the working population hasn't received a wage increase for the past decade. Not a single penny. The declining voter turnout for this year's presidential election, along with some street interviews with the workers and the young people, further validated the point that the playing up the national question is becoming less and less effective in elections. And the working class and young people have had enough on the lies and false promises. It doesn't mean, though, the ruling class will give it up. In fact, to save Taiwanese capitalism from the crisis and public anger, they have been relentlessly whipping up nationalism against China. Even though most Taiwanese people are fearful of communism because of the pressure of China, as well as traditional anti-communist propaganda that is still everywhere. We will be able to win the youth and the working class over to our organization, kicking out all the bosses, parties, and the U.S. imperialism. Under capitalism, whether Taiwan becomes annexed by China or declare a de jure independence, the result will be deeply reactionary for workers on both sides. International revolution is the only way out for the Taiwanese people. Genuine communist policies is the only way to free Taiwan from the deep sense of isolation and powerlessness. Myself and the comrades of the spark in Taiwan will bring the ideas of the RCI into Taiwan and bring the reaction, sorry, re revolutionary youth of Taiwan into the RCI. <laughs> Together, with all of you here, we will win the world revolution in our lifetime. I'm going to say this in both English and Chinese, and that will be the end of my contribution. So, long live the RCI, Workers of the World Unite! 革命共产国际万岁！全世界的无产者联合起来 ！Thank you so much. Okay, comrades, comrade Alan will now reply, and then we'll have the vote afterwards. So here we go. Well, comrades, I think we've had an excellent discussion, very, very wide-ranging discussion. So I only have time to touch on one or two points that were raised. But the main task of my reply is to draw all the threads together and draw some conclusions. Now, when future generations look back at this period in world history, I have no doubt that they will see this, the whole world situation, as one great terrifying nightmare. It's a living proof of Lenin's prediction when he said, capitalism is horror without end. That's a fact. And it, most people, when they, when they look at the world situation, they must conclude that the world has gone mad. They don't understand it. Everything is collapsing. It's like the end of the world. I think some people believe that. And by the way, the point I'm making is this. It's not the first time that we've seen this. By the way, Comrade came up to me all proud in the, in, in the, in the, in the break this morning, and he said, you know, you know what book I'm, I'm reading now on your advice? I said, what's that? Said, the Bible! 
I greatly fear that my message has been much in, uh, misunderstood. <laughs> I am, of course, an atheist, a militant atheist, although it's true, it's true I am a Protestant atheist, that's true. <laughs> there we are, never mind about that. But actually, if I dare quote from the Bible again, don't, 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 don't start on the Bible, folks. Right. My favorite book of the Bible is the book of Revelations, the book of Revelations, right at the end, you know, the apocalypse, the end of the world. By the way, Engels. Uh, uh, it's proven now that, that that book, which only narrowly got into the Bible, by the way, only narrowly, only was narrowly accepted, it's definitely the oldest Christian text, much older than the other Gospels, and it shows clearer than any of the others the real mindset of Christians at that time. And Engels wrote about that, actually. He wrote, he wrote a book on it, an article anyway. He wrote about it. You see, what you, under, what you must understand is that mindset was the result of a terrible, ghastly catastrophe, a terrible defeat of the Jewish people when the, the, the great Jewish uprising was put down viciously by the Romans who, who took the revenge on, on the Jews. There was a terrible, a, a indescribable slaughter of the whole population of, of Jerusalem. The whole population was put to the sword, men, men women, and children. And the temple, the Holy of Holies, was destroyed, but destroyed, completely destroyed. And after that terrible act of destruction, these poor people of Judea, they must have, but they did believe it was the end of the world. It, 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 must have been, it must have been like the world would look like after a nuclear explosion. And because now there was no, no question of, of, of fighting with arms, of an armed insurrection, they tried it and it failed. No question. The, they were a defeated and crushed people. So they turned towards spirituality and, and a, a, a kingdom of Jerusalem in the clouds, Christianity. But, but they, took, they took the revenge on the Romans in this book, the Apocalypse, the, the Revelations. It's a ferocious, ferocious denunciations of, of, of Rome. Babylon, they called it. Babylon the Great. What fantastic uh, revolutionary language, actually. Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I wish our comrades could write articles like that. <laughs> that, that passion, that language, that language of class hatred. But they thought, they thought, they, they thought that the end, of, the end of the world had come. They believed it. Now, you see, it wasn't the end of the world. What, 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 what everyone was beginning to experience, not just in Judea, but in general, was not the end of the world that was approaching but the end of a particular socio-economic system, the system of slavery, which was in crisis. That's what people felt in their bones. And it happened again, and at the end of feudalism, the end of feudalism, when the feudal system was collapsing, you had the phenomena such as the, the flagellant sects. You heard of the flagellant sects? They would go through the villages, thrashing themselves with whips, beating their native backs until they, they, they ran red with blood. I think some people pay for that, you know. <laughs> I've, never seen the, I've never seen the attraction in it myself, but I believe it's the case. No, no, but these were religious fanatics, religious fanatics. Uh, they went around and, and called, it's the end of the world, it's the end of the world. And it, it's, it's a similar world to the one we live in now. You, you read about the thir 30 years war in Germany, and I think you'd be horrified, horrified. And, but of course, again, it wasn't the end of the world that was announced by these events. These events announced something else. They announced the end of the feudal system, the end of one socioeconomic system. And of course, there's, there's two sides to this process. Yes, the end of one f system which is finished and the beginnings, the, the traumatic, the painful birth, the birth pangs of a new system, of a new society built on the ashes of the old society. Birth, yes, birth. Not just death, but birth. And birth is a painful experience. Pa painful, bloody experience. And therefore, when we see all these horrors, they are horrors. The initial reaction is to, is to be repelled. And to clutch your heads and say, well, the world has gone mad. Everything's collapsing. What is collapsing, my friends, is a social system that's absolutely rotten, bankrupt, that owes nothing to the, that's not capable of developing society. But it's a system that refuses to die. That's the point. Will not just die of its own accord. No, no, no. 
that a powerful interest of a tiny minority of very rich people who control the, the entire world much more than any other time in the past. The, the, level, the level of inequality is much higher than in the past. It's much higher than during the Roman Empire. It's an atrocious thing. These parasites, this tiny minority of parasites, super rich people, what do they do with these trillions, trillions that they possess? What do they do with them? You know, but you see, they are not prepared to give up their power and privileges. They are not prepared to accept the fact that their system is finished. They pay all kinds of clever people in the university to prove that it's the only system possible. Therefore, how can it be finished? One of the communists who spoke, he mentioned the, the, the collapse of Stalinism, the collapse of the Soviet Union and so on. Ah, yes. And the bourgeois were full of themselves, very full of themselves. One of these guys, Francis Fukuyama, you might, might have heard of him, this academic, said it's the end of history. Well, Mr. Fukuyama was somewhat wrong. That was not the end of history. It, it was, again, it was the end of a particular uh, bankrupt system, the system of Stalinism. This cor corrupted, twisted version of, of a, a nationalized planned economy, which as Trotsky predicted, always contained the seeds of its own destruction. It was bound, it was bound to collapse sooner or later, and it did collapse. Although I remember at the time, nobody thought, very few people thought that that was possible or probable. And again, the same dialectical process, please pay attention. It seemed that these monolithic Stalinist regimes, with a huge bureaucracy, their police force, their secret police, their prison camps, from the outside, they seemed to be a solid monolith which would never disappear. It would go on forever. So it seemed it wasn't the case. Contradictions were working inside that system and destroying it from within. But you see, when the collapse came, by God, it came suddenly, suddenly, when nobody expected it. The whole thing crumbled and collapsed overnight, practically. Tremendous shock. But Ted Grant actually said, I remember what Ted said at the time. He said, the collapse of the fall of Stalinism is, of course, a dramatic historic event. He said, yes. He said, but in retrospect, looking back on it, when future historians compare, it will only be seen as merely the prelude to a far more dramatic event, the final crisis of the capitalist system. When I say final crisis, that means a revolutionary crisis because the capitalist system will only be destroyed by the conscious movement of the working class. It's, it's, it's a bit like, a, you know, in, 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 Rus in Russian folk, folk tales, folk stories, there's a famous character called Kasche the Deathless. Kasche Bismirtni in Russian. A horrible, a horrible, degenerate, filthy monster. A skeleton, the flesh falling off his bones, about 10,000 years old, and he never died. He never died, and nobody could work out the secret of his death. Actually, it was hidden in a gigantic egg inside a tree until, until uh, the hero, Prince Ivan, came along and chopped and killed him, destroyed the egg and killed him. But the capitalist system, it's like that. It's like this horrible, disgusting, repellent, disintegrating creature. It's dead, but it's dead, but it's walking on his feet, like in a horror movie. It's dead, but it refuses to die, and it will never die unless it is physically overthrown by a power which is greater than itself. And that power exists. There is a power in society which is far greater than even the most powerful state, the biggest army, or the most efficient secret police. That is the power of the working class once it's organized and mobilized to change society. No force on earth can resist that once, once it's called into being. Yeah, but this force is being held back by the, the dead force of the, these bureaucratic uh, machines, apparatuses, called what, what, what you like. Parties which were created in the past, a long time ago, by the way, parties and trade unions, in order to represent the working class, which have become transformed into the tools of the ruling class. And that, comrades, is the problem of problems. That is the central problem. And therefore, it, it, it will be ultimately a struggle between the Communist Party, the Communists, and this ossified bureaucracy. But even, even that bureaucracy is beginning to be affected by the general malaise. I mentioned this uh, American trade union leader, Sean, what's his name? Sean, Sean Fain, that's right, Sean Fain. Calling for a general strike, well, we'll see whether, whether, he, whether he means it, we'll see it, we'll see. 
But as a symptom, that was important. The fact that he raised it is important. When he spoke calmly, Tom said, yes, but he's, got, he's made all kinds of stuff. In effect, he can't be trusted. He's like all the others. You know, that's, I, accept, I accept that. I accept that. Trotsky said, betrayal is inherent in reformism. All reformism. I would particularly stress, particularly left reformism. But be, be careful. Be careful. That does not mean necessarily that it, we're talking about a conscious, deliberate betrayal. In some cases, it's clearly conscience, conscience, as in the case of Starmer in Britain or this rat, uh, or, uh, Olaf Scholz in Germany and others. You know, it's deliberate, it's con they're conscious, deliberate agents of the ruling class. But you can have honest reformists. I think, I think Corbyn was honest. I think Bernie Sanders is honest. But you know, very often an honest, sincere <laughs> reformist can be more dangerous than a, than a, a conscious traitor. But in the end, the, their own limited understanding, limited whatever, they're not, the fact that they're not Marxist, will lead them to betrayal as night, as night follows day. So what's our attitude? I think several comments made the, uh, some correct, correct points. I can't remember. My, yeah, sorry. 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 I think Alessandro made, made the point. You know, these mass organizations still exist. We can't wish them away, wish they didn't exist. They do exist. They, they still have powerful roots in the working class. And they will only be destroyed, ultimately, by great events which are being prepared and will shake them from top to bottom. But therefore, our attitude towards these organizations must be careful. As for the sects, I think we've said, said enough about those people. We're not interested in them. By the way, they send us all... First of all, they will attack us. Then when, when we're too powerful to attack in the same way, when we're too successful, they start sending us nice letters. <laughs> Please, can we join you? Please, will you join us and join such and such a united front, all for unity? Or oh, please, can we join directly? We'd like to join you. Listen to me, dear friends. Watch my lips. I give you a, a clear piece of advice. Keep them out. I mean that sincerely. Or you'll have more trouble in your hands than the worth of it. You're not interested in any of those people. Not interested. The mass reformist parties and Stalinist parties, that's the, the communist parties, that's a different, that's a different question. Our, how we do it now? Our attitude will be, will be criticism, but it'll be friendly, com comedy criticism, not hysterical denunciations. In this case, this American trade union leader, the fact that he said something correct, partly correct, see, if these guys take one step forward or even half a step forward, we should applaud them. We should say, yeah, very good, very good. But we say two more things. Very good what you said, but action, not words. Set a date for what you're saying, although he, he has done that, but it's in a few years' time. And of course, uh, you, 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 you know, that, that, uh, that and what was I going to say? Robert, action. action, not words. That's the first point. There was another point. Oh, it'll come to me eventually, <laughs> you know. And... Uh, we, we, we will see what you do. And of course, if they take a step back, they don't do what they promised, then we will criticize them. Again, it could be not in an hysterical way. It'll be in a friendly but firm way, pointing out what, what, pointing out what they ought to be doing. Anyway, that's, uh, that's enough about that. What uh, Comrade Al Alexandro said was very correct. We have, we have made great progress. But, the, but you know, but think about this. And by the, this is an important. See, we've come, th we've come through a long period of uh, uh, an embryonic period, a period of small circles and so on. That's absolutely inevitable. All revolutionary parties pass through phase, phases like that. The Bolsheviks certainly pass through that phase. But that phase can have can, can have, leave some negative effects. Communists get bad habits, you know. And really speaking, as we become bigger, we need to change our mentality, change our methods. And above all, we must, we must develop a, a, a stronger confidence in ourselves. I sometimes get the impression there's a kind of inferiority complex or something, you know. Commas are always looking for somebody else to take an initiative. And, uh, oh yeah, and, and then, we'll, then we'll intervene and we'll sell the paper and whatever. No, no, no. If you see there's a possibility, why not? Why don't we take an initiative? Why don't we put ourselves in a leading position and let the others join us? Oh, by the way, there's one. Uh, we leave the sects alone in a minute. There's one small sect, peculiar sect in Britain called the Weekly Worker. Is it the Weekly Worker? Is called 
It's 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 sole activity for years and years. It's just uh, commenting on on other sects. You see, on other. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's his. Anyway, they were kind enough to write us a letter, and in the word of the Godfather, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse. <laughs> you know, please, please, can you jo Can we join you? We, we're willing to join you on condition that you give us faction rights. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I wasn't consulted at the time because I would have answered it in the fo with the following letter, reply letter. Dear comrades, thank you very much for your kind uh, offer. We, we wish to put a, a counter proposal. Why don't, you, why don't you work hard and build a, a strong organization? And when you've got over a thousand members, we might consider asking to join you with faction rights. <laughs> anyway, leave it alone. I, I must, I'm, I'm running out of time to finish. But to come to an important point, and it's something we often, we often forget about you. What are we actually fighting for? Uh, of course, Fred mentioned our program. Yes, we, may, we want uh, employment and houses and uh, good, nice health service and all the rest of it. That's true. But no, no, no. But that's that's not the, the that, that's not that's not our ultimate aim, is it? Co we are communists. Communists. We are fighting for communism, and communism doesn't doesn't mean a few more houses or a few more jobs or higher wages. Communism means a higher level of human civilization. Think about it. We are accu we are accused of being utopians. We are not utopians. There is not a not an atom of utop utopianism in what we propose. I think it was Comrade Paris who spoke, very, very, very interesting contribution. In the course of his, his contribution, he said, culture has a material basis. That's very true. The whole history of class society is based on one thing, the alienation of the masses from culture. That's what it means. The difference between mental, mental and, and manual labor, thinkers and doers, masters and slaves, to this very day, that's the case. The masses, the masses are, are not just economically uh, alienated, alienated from the product of their labor. They are culturally, intellectually, and spiritually alienated. Okay, S separated from culture. That means humanity is separated from its better, its higher self, reduced to the role of a slave, of a robot, a, a per person that doesn't think, that doesn't feel, that is nothing. It's less than a human being. And the meaning of a revolution is precisely that these slaves begin to lose their slave psychology and raise themselves up to the level of real human, free human beings, free men and women with a heart and a soul and a brain and aspirations, aspirations to something better, something higher. That's why, you know, it is one thing that makes me very angry when I hear people, some comrades say, I've heard it, oh, the workers are not interested in culture, the workers are not interested in art. When I hear words like that, I think you know that I am from a work, working class family. I'm the first member of my entire family that had a secondary education, never mind about a university education. A person that is ca capable, capable of saying something like that shows me, first of all, that person is not a worker. That person does not know the working class, hasn't got the faintest idea how workers think or feel. That person, I'm sorry to say this, is a stinking petty bourgeois with the arrogance of a petty bourgeois and the innate snobbery of a petty bourgeois. It re really makes me angry. And it is not true. Emphatically, it's not. I know it's not true. You see, look, perhaps you haven't experienced a revolution, but you speak to any worker that's been involved in a strike particularly a big strike, that involves a large number of workers. A strike is like a mini revolution. All the elements of a revolution are present in a strike. And in a strike, strange things happen. People you thought were very backward and not interested and they would never move, become transformed in front of your very eyes. Unbelievable. Women in particular, who never took them, they, become, they rise up to a new stature. And that's also, to, to, to a million times more, that's true of a revolution. I come back to what Paris says. Culture has a material base. The reason why we are not utopians is because thanks to capital, let's take our hat off to capitalism. Let's th let's th we thank capitalism from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you. This monstrous system, this unjust, brutal, bloody system 
over a period of two centuries or so, has built all the needs of all the material means for socialism. This wonderful technology. I see the Chinese now, they put a, a rocket uh, on the other side of the moon. There's this debate about artificial intelligence. But you see, this wonderful technology, if it was properly used in a rational way, in a harmonious plan of production, you could solve all the problems of the human race within a, a very short space of time, practically immediately. Houses and th schools and universities and hospitals would not be a problem. But it's, it's much more than that. It's much more than that. See, one of the most criminal aspects of capital is the waste in every sense. Above all, the human waste. Trotsky once asked, once asked a very good question. How many Aristotles are herding swine, uh, uh, looking after pig, pigs? And he added, how many swine herds are sitting on thrones? You see, in the course of so many, so many tens of thousands of years, the amount of geniuses, what people would call geniuses, is very few, very few. You can name them. Beethoven, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein. Let's take Albert Einstein. The man was a genius. Okay. But think about it. What if Albert Einstein had been born in a mud hut in Bangladesh? Do you think, do you think he would have done the things which he did? I am prepared to accept that genius may be partly uh, genetic. Maybe, maybe, yes, an element. This man was born with certain abilities. In his native village, he might have aspired to a certain level as a carpenter, maybe as a poet, maybe as a singer. But would he, would he have discovered the mysteries of uh, relativity theory? The question answers itself. But how many Einsteins exist today that have, been, that have had the, the life and the potential crushed out of them by this criminal system? And there's no need for that. What communism means, among other things, is the radical abolition of this monstrous wall separating manual from non-manual labor. Communism would throw open the gates, which have been locked and barred, preventing the masses from obtaining the necessary knowledge and culture. And you'd see the greatest genuine cultural revolution that has ever been known in the history of this planet. That is the way in which you change people's thinking, people's behavior, how men relate to women, how human beings relate to other human beings. It is animal society. You treat people like, like animals, they will behave like animals. Communism for the first time. Communism is for the first time. The rebirth of the human race. Neither more nor less what Leon Trotsky said. For, for a paradise in this world, that's what we are fighting for, because there is no other world. You only live once. Life is a precious gift. Communism, for the first time, would allow people to live a genuine full life instead of this misery, this boredom, this crushing routine, which is the lot of, of almost every man and woman on the planet. And I finished up with this idea. If that is not a sacred cause, if that is not a, a cause that's worth fighting and dying for, I don't know what is. And ultimately, it depends on us, it depends on the people in this hall and the other thousands which are looking at this meeting and listening to what we have to say. Are we willing and able to rise to this cause, to this challenge? I say, yes, we are. And on that basis, I think we should all pledge ourselves here and now. When we launch this new international, it's not just a formal question. Put your hands up. Yes, it's a, it's a Not at all. Not at all. It means that you, we are pledging ourselves, heart and soul, to the only cause which is worthwhile fighting for. With that thought in my mind, I will hand back to the speaker, and we will proceed to the important task, which is the launching of the new revolutionary communist international.